And now the House Government Reform Committee meeting on procedures for their upcoming campaign finance investigation. We'll hear from the chairman of the committee, Dan Burton, the ranking member, Henry Waxman, and other members. The hearing's a little over four hours. The, the committee will come to order. Will uh, members please take their seats and will guests uh, please take their seats and uh, try to get the level of conversation down to a manageable level. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. Today the committee meets to attend to two administrative matters. The first will be the approval of the document protocol for the 105th Congress. The second will be the approval of the committee budget views and estimates. The three bills we originally planned to consider at this meeting will be taken up at a later date. As is the practice in this committee, I will give an opening statement and the ranking member will then give his and then we will proceed directly to amendments. First, we turn to the issue of formally adopting a protocol for the handling, handling, storage, and release of documents obtained by the committee during the course of our investigation. Since the start of this investigation, the committee has obtained documents and stored them in a locked, secured area within the committee's offices according to procedures I instituted as chairman. I will today present our document procedures to the committee and ask that it, be, it formally be adopted. The committee will then handle documents for the balance of this investigation as provided in this protocol. Let me state at the outset that one of the key purposes of a congressional investigation is to illuminate facts and not to hide them. The American people have a right to know what their government and its employees are doing. Congressional oversight is an essential tool in holding government officials accountable for their actions. As President Woodrow Wilson said decades ago, it is the proper duty of a representative body to look diligently into every affair of government and to talk much about what it sees. Unless Congress has and uses every means of acquainting itself with the acts and disposition of the administrative agents of government, the country must be helpless to learn how it is being served. The informing function of Congress should be preferred even to its legislative function. I want to restate that last part after everybody's microphone is off. The informing function of Congress should be preferred even to its legislative action. End quote. Congressional investigations by their nature are far different from a judicial inquiry where a grand jury conducts all matters secretly. <coughs> Public disclosure of the facts is the essence and in large part the purpose of congressional oversight. Therefore, in adopting a document protocol, we do, do so not to hide any facts, but to provide an orderly process of disclosing relevant facts and information in the course of the investigation. When improprieties or illegal actions are exposed, this committee reports findings and recommendations. The authorizing committees withstanding provide remedies, and Congress can refer matters to the proper authorities for legal action. The focus of this investigation will center on well-publicized allegations of possible attempts to corrupt the American political process or compromise national security. Our investigative efforts will seek to determine whether and to what extent illegal actions or foreign money influence government officials or official government policies and actions. Substantial evidence of improprieties will be pursued wherever it leads. Naturally, there will be priorities in our investigation. This committee is charged by the House with the primary oversight of the executive branch. Traditionally, 
The committee's focus has been on executive branch operations and that tradition will continue. However, that does not preclude the committee from investigating substantial evidence of improprieties within its jurisdiction. We are not going to prejudge where the facts will take us. To date, the extraordinary range of matters already publicly disclosed about questionable fundraising, including important national security questions, will challenge our capacity to conduct a thorough investigation. This week's reports that White House officials may have improperly disclosed, disclosed top secret classified information regarding a reputed Russian mob figure who attended a presidential fundraising dinner and the recent disclosures about the Chinese Embassy's possible attempts to funnel illegal foreign money into campaigns have raised the most serious concerns and are by necessity a national priority to examine. The committee already has amassed a large body of documents that contain very disturbing information about the conduct of senior government officials and donors with highly unusual access. The degree to which the White House and key witnesses cooperate will also determine the pace and the scope of our work. The Fifth Amendment claims of key witnesses such as John Wong, Webb Hubble, and Mark Middleton already have significantly hampered the progress of the investigation and will necessitate much additional work. Other key witnesses such as Charlie Tree and Pauline Kinchanilak have left the country and we can't get a hold of them. The minority seeks concurrence or a full committee vote on every subpoena and every document release. But given this administration's deny and delay document production habits characterized by the Washington Post as, quote, dribs and drabs, this investigation would never be completed if the full committee had to consider separately and vote on each and every subpoena. However, we are committed to consulting with the minority on subpoenas and inviting them to constructively contribute to the process. We already have numerous witnesses who have claimed Fifth Amendment privileges, as stated above, making it necessary to seek documents related to these individuals from a variety of sources such as banks, phone companies, and employers. I have invited the minority to participate in the subpoena process and will continue to consult with them on the issuance of subpoenas. Current committee rules allow the chairman to issue subpoenas and if these subpoenas are not complied with, the full committee and in turn the full house votes on contempt measures when necessary. The minority will be provided a copy of subpoenas and document requests at least 24 hours before issuance and we will provide the opportunity for the minority to be consulted and to constructively contribute to the process. The minority has been and will continue to be consulted with on every document request, subpoena and proposed document release except in special cases. Let me pause here for the beeps and then we'll go vote and come back for Mr. Waxman's statement. In regard to the release of documents again, I would... That's what I was expecting. One moment, please. In regard to the release of documents again, I would remind my colleagues that the purpose of a congressional investigation is to provide the public with the right to know the facts behind these matters. I would note that all of the documents that have been released to date have been released by the White House and we have not released any documents except a small number that had already been released by the White House or other sources. If there are documents that are classified national security documents, these are already covered by law and cannot be released unless declassified through the proper channels. While there will be some documents considered sensitive or in need of some level of confidentiality, many of the documents that some may seek to classify as confidential often are of significant investigative importance and not truly confidential but rather politically embarrassing. Nevertheless, the document protocols provides for individuals and entities providing documents to identify those they consider confidential and then the documents will be reviewed to determine how they should be treated. As for the budget allocation, the allocation provided to the minority is far in excess of the budgets provided in years past when Republicans were in the minority. When Democrats were last in the majority, they provided the minority with anywhere from 11 to 17 percent of the investigative resources of the committee. We have committed to providing 25 percent of the investigative staff to the minority. This is more than any previous House minority investigative staff has ever received. It is also the largest minority staff budget in the House in fiscal year 1997. As we move forward with this important investigation, it is my hope 
that we will have a bipartisan consensus to follow the facts wherever they lead and ensure that all serious matters are properly addressed in a nonpartisan fashion. We will provide the facts to the American people and give the facts a public airing and then let the public decide. And I'd just like to say that I've had over the past few days an opportunity to meet on a couple of occasions with my counterpart, the, the uh, ranking minority member, Mr. Waxman. We spent about two hours together this morning. I, I hope we have a good working relationship. I intend to, on our side, make sure it's a good working relationship. And uh, I look forward to uh, getting on with the investigation. With that, Mr. Waxman, do you want to make your statement now or when we return? Okay, the House, uh, the committee will stand in recess until after this vote. I hope everybody will return right away. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. What this committee is being asked to do is uh, really quite unprecedented. It, if the majority adopts the protocol that is being placed before us today, it will give Chairman Burton unprecedented power that no member of Congress has ever had. And in fact, nobody in the country has had the power that he would have invested in him. This is not about personalities, but a rational process for Congress to conduct an important investigation. The chairman wants the power to unilaterally issue subpoenas. And he also wants the power to unilaterally decide to disclose information, even if it's confidential information involving an attorney-client privilege the medical histories of someone, an FBI informant's name, he alone would make that decision. I want to emphasize that no other investigation by a committee of the Congress has ever had such powers in its chairman. What we will seek to do on the Democratic side is offer amendments that would have us follow the same procedures adopted by the Senate and which is guiding the Senator Thompson's investigation. In terms of the scope of the investigation, the Senate voted 99 to nothing to expand the scope to look at all campaign funding abuses. In terms of issuing subpoenas, Senator Thompson is following the established precedent that he will seek the uh, support of the minority for issuing a subpoena or if there's a disagreement submitted to a vote of the committee. In terms of releasing con controversial documents that are considered uh, confidential, he will go to his committee. This is an investigation by this committee, not Chairman Dan Burton. And all the members of this committee ought to be able to resolve the issues when there is a dispute. There has been no explanation given why this committee, at this time, needs to follow extraordinary procedures. We will ask that the uh, procedures that we will uh, follow be reasonable. And I want to give an example by showing a chart. Over 100 subpoenas have already been issued by the chairman, by himself. And if we can have the chart on display, this chart shows the people affiliated in some way with the Democratic Party who have been subpoenaed to give information to this committee. Now, let me emphasize, when a subpoena is issued, it's not a small matter, because when a subpoena is issued, it means that immediately you have to go out and hire an attorney. You have to be fearful that you may well comply inadequately and therefore be held in criminal contempt of Congress. 
people will be required to turn over information that they otherwise wouldn't give. They are being coerced into it. It is a, it is a very forceful action by the Congress of the United States to get action, to get information. That's a chart that shows the people who have unilaterally been asked by the chairman to submit documents. Now I'd like to have a display of a, another chart, and it will show the people who have been affiliated with the Republican fundraising who have been subpoenaed for information before this committee. Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the budget, and I didn't realize that was going to be on the agenda today, and I'll say it as nicely as possible to disagree with you. We think that this budget is distribution is unfair as well. As we start this inquiry, with a particularly sensitive political nature to it, we have a disagreement on the budget, we've had a disagreement on the scope of the investigation, we have a disagreement on the empowering the chairman with such authority to subpoena information as never been heard before, and we disagree about how sensitive confidential information may be released. I su submit it is most unfortunate that we cannot follow the same procedures following, uh, that, this, that is being done in the Senate in this very same investigation on these very same matters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I go on with the business at hand, I would just like to correct one minor uh, part of my colleague's statement, and that is that uh, my predecessor and uh, other people who preceded me as chairman on this committee had the same subpoena authority that I have. Mr. Chairman, are amendments in order? Uh, one, one moment. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. The clerk will call up the document protocol. Protocol for documents. This protocol sets forth the procedures to follow by the House Committee on Government Reform and Oversight, the committee and its subcommittees for obtaining, storing, and releasing of documents and other materials. Uh, before we proceed, uh, the Vice Chairman had uh, uh, something he wanted to add to the record real quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just ask uh, that my opening statement be included for the record. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that all members be allowed to insert an opening statement in the record. Without objection. Uh, without objection, the protocol will be considered as read and open for amendment. Are there any amendments? All right, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California for an amendment. I have an amendment on the issue of, uh, on the, on the issue of subpoenas. Staff will pass out the amendment. On page two in paragraph entitled, Procedures for Issuance of Subpoenas after the last sentence, insert the following. Except in the emergency of circumstances as provided in section 2AB, the chairman will not issue subpoenas without a committee vote or the concurrence of the ranking minority member. The gentleman from California is recognized to speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's start off this discussion of the subpoena power uh, issue by stating the facts. Previous chairmen, under the rules, have been given the power to issue subpoenas. But the practice has always been that a chairman would seek concurrence by the minority or, if there were a dispute, submit it to a vote of the committee. This was the practice of, uh, of all the Democratic chairmen of the committee, uh, of, uh, of this particular committee. It's the practice of other committees that state in their rules the chairman has the power to issue subpoenas. It has been the practice in every investigation that's been conducted by the committee. And I have a, another chart, if, if someone has it available uh, to display, to go through those investigations that have been conducted by the Congress of the United States. Because when the Whitewater investigation by Senator D'Amato was conducted in the Senate, he proceeded on the basis that any subpoena he wanted to issue, he had the concurrence of the minority or a vote of the committee. When the Watergate investigation was being conducted, they too had the chairman follow this process. When we had the Iran-Contra investigation, the subpoenas were issued, again, only with the concurrence of the minority or a vote of the committee. And the uh, committee investigation in the Senate by Senator Thompson is following that procedure as well. 
I don't know why we can't follow the time-honored procedure of the chairman having the committee act. Again, this is not one person's investigation. It is our committee's investigation. To ask somebody information about a subpoena, through a subpoena, is a very important fundamental power. And power should not be concentrated in any one individual. Our whole system of government is based on checks and balances so that we don't have power abused. Mr. Chairman, if you have all the power to issue subpoenas and you have all the power to release the documents, you may think you won't abuse it, but power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's why we've always had in the rules, and we ought to continue to have in the rules, the requirement that if there is a dispute as to whether a subpoena is valid or makes sense, or was it within the scope of the investigation, that it be uh, one voted on by this committee. And so I uh, submit this uh, change to your uh, protocol to uh, establish those as the ground rules under which we will conduct uh, uh, any issuance of subpoenas. I expect that on most subpoenas, we will concur in the issuance of the subpoenas. Uh, we will want to get all the information. We have requested a full investigation of all campaign finance matters. And if people won't submit Im important, relevant information to us voluntarily, then we ought to subpoena it. And we will support that effort. But we don't think it's right for any one individual to have such enormous power to uh, issue subpoenas. Now, there can be extraordinary circumstances. You might find that papers and documents are about to be shredded. Then in that case, the chairman ought to have the power to act immediately. We don't disagree with that. But if it's not a matter of such urgency, then we ought to follow the regular process. And I submit to the committee this amendment uh, to uh, change the rules and to restore to our rules what has always been the practice of this committee and all other committees. Yield back the balance of my time. Thanks, thank gentlemen. Uh, let me. Any, any, anyone wish to speak on uh, this uh, this amendment? The gentleman from California, Mr. Lantos, is recognized for five minutes. Oh, pardon me. I did, Mr. Barr. Oh, pardon me. Uh, recognized by public interest, Mr. Thank Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, perhaps in a uh, in a in a perfect world, uh, the uh, proposal by the ranking member would would make some sense. But I don't think it really reflects, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, the reality of the work either of the Congress uh, or of this committee or indeed of any committee. Uh, it is very difficult, as uh, all members know, uh, to obtain uh, uh, full attendance at every single meeting. Uh, things happen out there in the real world that, as much as we might like to think otherwise, do not happen uh, precisely according to the schedule of what is happening in the Congress. And therefore, uh, much as, uh, for example, Mr. Chairman, my work is a federal prosecutor, uh, the essence of what you do as a prosecutor, the same as what this committee does, uh, has to have built into it a great deal of flexibility. And that is why uh, the procedures are what they are, and I believe I, uh, that the proposed uh, protocol, uh, for which I commend the chairman, uh, stepping forward as has not been done under prior Congresses, uh, under prior uh, majority rule. Uh, and put a procedure down in writing uh, for full debate uh, and for a vote uh, reflects reality that in some instances the, uh, the committee, uh, through its duly constituted chairman, uh, has to move quickly, has to have the flexibility. Uh, and very frankly, of course, uh, it's nice to bring charts in uh, uh, showing all sorts of things. Uh, one could just as well, I suppose, have brought a chart in that would extend around the entire circumference of this room, Mr. Chairman, with regard to all of the individuals whose names have been mentioned just in news articles over the past few months that uh, have not been subpoenaed. Uh, and that would prove no more than, uh, no more or no less uh, than what this chart does. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, additionally, Mr. Chairman, uh, when a subpoena issues, it does not guarantee that those documents will be immediately uh, forthcoming. Uh, there is uh, frequently, depending on the uh, particular uh, persons involved, the uh, particular inclinations of an administration or a particular department may in fact be a very deliberate 
move uh, not to comply with subpoenas and to drag out the furnishing of information. And this also, I think, reflects uh, the reality of the world out there, Mr. Chairman, that, uh, and that is that there needs to be a great deal of flexibility. Uh, the Senate is a fine body, uh, but uh, I doubt that uh, everybody on the other side that in this instance might be clamoring us to, uh, for us to emulate uh, and copy what the Senate does would like us to emulate and copy everything else that they do. Uh, I think we have an obligation to our constituents and to the rules of this House uh, and to uh, the work that we are charged with doing that, uh, very frankly, Mr. Chairman, has nothing to do with what the Senate is doing. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the Chairman here has been very open in addressing uh, these, uh, these issues, uh, putting together this protocol uh, and uh, moving forward. And I think that uh, the protocol uh, and indeed the reality of how a Chairman in the modern world has to be able to respond to the real world of an administration, particularly one that is not predisposed to be forthcoming with information pursuant to congressional subpoenas, uh, has to operate. Uh, and I think that uh, this, uh, this particular amendment would completely gut that and would uh, cause great, great impediments to what the chairman is after here, uh, and that is to, uh, to get at the truth. So I would uh, urge uh, members on both sides of the aisle certainly to think very carefully uh, before voting for something that may have a great deal of partisan uh, appeal on the surface uh, and think very carefully about the realities under which we have to operate uh, and not to, uh, not to pass this amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to address the issue of credibility that this investigation will have. We have talked about the procedures of the parallel Senate committee, and uh, I would like to bring some institutional memory from this committee's work to this issue. A few years ago, when I served as chairman of our subcommittee on employment and housing, we conducted a two-year investigation involving some 30 public hearings into the subject of fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement of the Department of Housing and Urban Development under the Reagan administration. Mr. Shays of uh, our committee was uh, my ranking member. I would like to bring to your attention, Mr. Chairman, and to the attention of all of my colleagues, the fact that every single subpoena that was issued during the course of our two-year investigation was issued after extensive consultation between Mr. Shays and myself. We were in full accord on every single decision and every single subpoena issued by the subcommittee was done on the basis of a unanimous vote of the entire subcommittee, all Republicans and all Democrats voting aye. Far from this being a partisan appeal, as the gentleman from Georgia just indicated, by voting for this amendment, we will take the first substantive step to make this investigation a bona fide bipartisan investigation. Unless this investigation is perceived to be bipartisan and is in fact bipartisan, it will have no credibility. I think it's extremely important for you, Mr. Chairman, to be sensitive to the enormous array of editorial judgments that this committee has been offered by the media thus far. Conservative, moderate, and liberal publications, public interest groups. They are all cautioning against a witch hunt and a non-bipartisan investigation. We are dealing with a great deal of federal tax money, more than any committee in memory. We are dealing with important matters. The American people clearly do not believe that all the angels are on one side of the campaign finance issue. And I think it's important that the American people, Republicans and Democrats and independents alike, have some confidence that this serious investigation is undertaken 
in a bipartisan manner. You're <coughs> assuming sole responsibility for the issuance of subpoenas totally undermines the credibility of this investigation. We on our side are prepared to work with you in a cooperative and bipartisan fashion. But I think it's important for you to understand that by arrogating to yourselves all relevant powers, you make effective cooperation impossible. So I'm earnestly making a plea to my Republican friends to approve this amendment, because it will be the first significant step towards making the investigation bipartisan and thereby enhancing its credibility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lantos. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've been a member of this committee for uh, five years, and uh, uh, I cannot remember in the history of this committee uh, that there was ever a formal pro call document before the committee. So uh, what the chairman is proposing here today is in fact unprecedented. He is proceeding with a very fair uh, protocol. The question of uh, the issuance of subpoenas. To date, our uh, committee has issued 101 subpoenas. We're not working the way we were two years ago when the, uh, we were in session just about every uh, other day. If you look at what's taken place so far and the subpoenas that have been issued, and if we didn't have the authority which we would like to proceed under, uh, what would be the situation? And look at where the, all the subpoenas issued have really related to five individuals who are the center of the uh, committee's investigation. Uh, Webster Hubble, who's invoked the Fifth Amendment. John Huang, also claimed the uh, Fifth Amendment. Mark Middleton, he claimed the Fifth Amendment. Pauline Kanchanilak, uh, she's fled the country, and we learned that uh, there was document shredding uh, going on at the time that uh, we issued uh, uh, subpoenas. Uh, Charlie Tree, and he's left the country. I submit, and if you, you review the history of, of the investigations in this Congress and investigations in this history, the history of this country, that we are probably engaged in one of the, the, uh, the most uh, broad scandals uh, in, the, in the history of this uh, republic. I just clipped a couple of clippings from about the last couple of days, headline after headline, article after article, uh, and, I, and I have a list of them here. Uh, it's almost impossible for the uh, chairman, the staff, uh, and uh, chairman of a subcommittee like myself to keep up with the, uh, the, the mounting uh, scandal that we see before us. So it is unfortunate uh, that, we, uh, that we must proceed in this fashion. But given the time constraints, given the history of uh, this committee and the way it proceeds, I think that this is more than fair. I had a discussion this morning with some folks and I said, you know, I served on this committee uh, in 1993, under, and I was a minority member, and I cited as an example Mr. Towns, how fairly he ran the committee, and it sounded like Mr. Lantos and Mr. Shays uh, got together uh, real well. Uh, but I also saw many abuses, and I won't bring them up here, of how this committee and other committees were run, both with a, with a subpoena process, investigations process, and hearing process. And it's not our intent on this side to be unfair in any manner. We're willing to work with the other side. I told the ranking member we do that. All of us want a fair hearing. And it, should, it isn't that we have to have a bipartisan hearing. That's not what these in investigations are about, bipartisan investigations. They should be nonpartisan. That's not what these issues are about. So uh, we want to proceed uh, in a fair fashion. We think the subpoena power under these unprecedented circumstances uh, 
uh, fits with precedent we've seen in the House, and we're presenting here a protocol that's unprecedented even by uh, presenting it in this fashion. And I'll, I don't want to get into it uh, in detail, but even when the ranking member uh, conducted hearings, he held 11 hearings uh, in, his, in his tobacco investigations before any document protocol was established. So we're doing it now, we're doing it up front, and we're doing it in a fair uh, manner to all concerned. I thank you and yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman uh, from West Virginia, Mr. Wise, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to hear talking about precedent. I've, gentleman has had five years on this committee. I'm now heading into my 15th, and I'd like to talk a little bit about precedent as well. First of all, protocols aren't necessary most of the time because you have established rules of procedure. You do have special investigations, such as this committee has embarked upon in the past, both under Democratic and Republican chairs. To the gentleman from Florida. I would refer you, to, sir, to, if we're talking about precedent, I'm not sure how recent a precedent you need, but last year, in the last session of Congress, uh, during the so-called Travelgate uh, hearings, there was a protocol, if you look at Rule 19, special affidavits and depositions. And I think it's timely and worthwhile to look at what this committee, under Republican leadership, approved under those, that situation. Uh, under Rule 19, the chairman upon consultation at, uh, with ranking member, minority member, may authorize the take, taking of affidavits and of depositions pursuant to notice or subpoena. I'm reading down to subsection B. Notwithstanding committee rule 18D, the committee shall not authorize and issue a subpoena for a deposition without the concurrence of the ranking minority member or the committee. So this committee thought it was important then at a time of uh, important investigation to have this kind of protection and this kind of procedure. And I would submit to you, sir, that this indeed is a protocol and indeed this committee has operated under standard rules and protocols in the past and that's what we're asking here today. There's nothing unprecedented about the fact you're coming out with a protocol good for you. What's in the protocol? What is it that's necessary to, to do away with the ordinary rules and practices of this committee? Mr. Chairman, uh, I happen to believe that this is an important set of investigations you're embarking upon. Whether the, uh, let the chips fall where they may, whether it's with Democrats, serious allegations of uh, illeg perhaps illegalities or improprieties dealing with the White House or with Republicans. And I might note that there's only one of the two campaigns in 1996 that have had a conviction and somebody's paid a fine, and that was in Senator Dole's campaign. And so I think that we ought to be looking at both sides' presidential campaign to see where the chips should fall. I think we ought to be looking at congressional fundraising practices. I don't know whether we are. I read the New York Times today. They suggest that we might be. But Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I've got a question. And my question is, if the photographer wouldn't mind moving for a second. Uh, my question is, um, uh, in the perfect world, what was so, so imperfect? Or what is it that's changed so that in very important times in our past, we've been able to have a procedure in which the ranking member uh, or at least the full committee voted upon subpoenas. Watergate hearings, probably the most crucial in our nation's history. Were unilateral subpoenas issued? No. Uh, were unilateral releases of privilege and confidential documents permitted? No. Iran-Contra, unilateral subpoenas issued? No. Unilateral release of confidential documents? No. Whitewater, Unilateral release of subpoenas? No. Re unilateral release of confidential information? No. House ethics? Unilateral release of information? No. Unilateral subpoenas issued? No. Thompson investigation to begin in the Senate uh, on this su very subject? Unilateral release of subpoenas? No. Unilateral release of information? No. The Burton investigation here in the House, why is it that this one requires unilateral subpoenas being issued and unilateral release of privileged and confidential documents being issued? Mr. Chairman, I also, I, as one who's been here 15 years, I, I always believe in the work product of this committee, and it's something we have to be proud of. And I make an appeal to you, sir, because I think you want the very same thing. And what concerns me greatly is that the work product of this committee may be called into question in a very crucial time because of this practice of unilateral issue of subpoenas and unilateral release of information. I think you would want the entire committee involved in making these important decisions. If you think that this, the minority party is somehow frustrating you, you, you have the bully pulpit. You can point that out if you feel that subpoenas that should be issued are not being. But I, 
but, but you also have the majority, of course, that can ultimately uh, achieve that result. But I would think in something that is this crucial, you would want to have everybody behind you, not just you, out there alone, issuing subpoenas on your own judgment and also deciding who it is that gets confidential inf information relief, uh, released. So, Mr. Chairman, I uh, urge you to reconsider uh, this, uh, this process. Even your own protocols of this committee that were adopted by your party in the past session of Congress to conduct uh, important investigations did not go this far, and I would urge you not to go this far on this important investigation. I yield to the gentleman from California. Since you have more time, let me explain to everybody why we have a protocol. The chairman assumed that he could unilaterally release information. The parliamentarian informed him that the House rules prevented that, because the committee rules would not give him that authority. So we are here today precisely for the reason that the chairman is seeking extraordinary powers. That is why we have a protocol before us. Otherwise, we would be conducting the, this investigation under the regular rules and procedures of this committee and the regular rules and procedures of all other committees, which would mean that the chairman would have to get concurrence with the minority or a vote of his own committee to sustain his desire to issue a subpoena or to go out and release confidential information. And since you still have a green light, I want to mentioned some of the uh, subpoenas that have been issued. One was to the get all the records of the Air Force One requiring disclosure of phone calls made by the President and his national security team to heads of state regarding sensitive foreign policy policy uh, negotiations, uh, also beyond uh, uh, seeking the names of uh, donors who travel on official delegations, uh, all the other people who, and all the information and recommendations from official trips abroad. Now these, inf these documents could then be released, and some of them can involve national security. It ought not to be up to one person alone to get these documents and then to make them public. The investigation is the committee's investigation. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Let me uh, just make a couple of uh, brief comments. First of all, regarding the subpoena to the White House and the uh, Air Force One issue, uh, we are working with the White House to make sure that national security is in no way breached. All we want to do is find out information pertaining to the allegations that this committee is investigating. Uh, with that, let me uh, next recognize Mr. Sessions of uh, Texas. Mr. Chairman, thank you. <coughs> I found the uh, discussions this morning of great interest and uh, find myself without any institutional knowledge as a freshman sitting back and listening to discussions that are going on, but I do have a memory of some past investigations that have been discussed, one of them Watergate and the other the Iran-Contra investigation. And my knowledge and memory tells me that during each one of those issues, not only was the media highly involved in that investigation, but there were members of the Republican Party uh, with the knowledge that the Watergate investigation was against a Republican administration, as well as Iran-Contra. There were members of the Republican Party who joined in with the media on these committees and, and tried to approach it in a bipartisan fashion up front. They recognized that there were constitutional issues that were involved. They recognized that there were abuses that were going on. And I really have yet to see members of the other side, the other party, joining into wanting to look at things that were done wrong, constitutional issues, and questions. Whereas in each of these other events, there were not only Warren Rugman as a senator, but other Republicans who demanded, who went for information, who were calling on the president to release information that was important not only for the investigation, but for the truth to come out. And so I'm sitting back hearing us be attacked that we are not being fair, but I think that if we're going to work in a bipartisan fashion, what we've got to do is to recognize it's up to the other side to call for sanity and soundness in the total release of documents in this behalf also. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I appreciate your yielding. Uh, just to give me an opportunity to respond to the uh, subpoenas that have been issued uh, by this uh, committee. I said 101 subpoenas have been issued by this committee. 
Thank you. Of that, two were issued to the uh, uh, White House, one to the Justice Department, one to the DNC. The balance, and my math is not uh, very good, but we'll just say 98 because one was also uh, issued an unrelated subpoena to Craig Livingstone. We're still trying to find out who uh, hired him. But uh, in any event, all of the remainder of the uh, subpoenas, uh, in fact, relate to the individuals who I uh, cited who uh, claim the Fifth Amendment uh, to avoid producing documents to this committee or have fled the country. Now, uh, if uh, the other side has some problem with this, I, I would like to know about it. And Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that this list a uh, uh, complete list of those uh, subpoenas issued by our committee be made a part of this record. Is it appropriate to ask that now, Mr. Chairman? Uh, without objection. Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Would the gentleman uh, who has a I yield back yield to, to the gentleman? Uh, would the gentleman yield to me for a... I will yield for one minute, Mr. Waxman. I, I just want to make clear to you that as far as I'm concerned, I want an aggressive investigation. I've, I'm one of the few members of Congress who said along with an, a, an aggressive congressional investigation, I'd be willing to go along with an in, independent investigator of the uh, White House uh, uh, business. But uh, I think you're going to see that the members on this side of the aisle want an investigation. We want it to be aggressive, but we want it to be fair and we want it to be bipartisan. And I thank you for yielding to me. Uh -huh. Mr. Chairman, my final remarks would be, and that is that I believe we need to have a bipartisan call for the truth to come out, and that we should encourage the White House and we should encourage these people who have been subpoenaed to participate fully, not only with this committee, but not to hide behind the Fifth Amendment, to bring this uh, whole matter out to the public to where we can make uh, assertion of, uh, of the problems that have occurred. Thank you. I would just like to say before I recognize the next speaker that uh, we intend to do our dead level best to be as fair as possible with the minority and to work with you to make sure we do have a fair investigation. <coughs> and with that, I'd like to uh, recognize my good friend from Pennsylvania, Mr. Konjorski. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me, Mr. Townsend. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just sort of uh, begin by saying a couple of things, because I am really disturbed. Mm -hmm. The people from the 10th Congressional District in Brooklyn did not send me to Congress to be a prop. They sent me to participate, to make decisions, and what you are saying is that you want to leave us out. And I also want to respond to the comment by saying that Watergate was different. Watergate was not different. Let me just read in terms of what was said by then Chairman Rodino from New Jersey. He said such subpoena authority of the committee may be exercised by the chairman and the ranking minority member acting jointly. Or if either declines to act by the other acting alone, except that in the event either so declines, either shall have the right to refer to the committee for decision the question whether such authority shall be so exercised and the committee shall be convened promptly to render that decision. So what is this information about Watergate being different? Because this is what happened, this is what Chairman Rodino said. And let me just sort of point out one other thing. I'm looking at that board and I'm looking at the names on that board. It points out in terms of where you're trying to go with this and it really bothers me. I thought we would take this opportunity to look at the whole situation around uh, what's happening in terms of fundraising and all of that, and maybe come up with some real important information to move forward with campaign reform. But I look there, the only names I see are people that are somewhere or another connected with the Democrats. And I think that if that points out you know, where you're going right there. So I think then, then to come and to find out that you just want to subpoena everybody, and I think that you need to be careful with that. Because you're going to subpoena some folks and you're going to lead to some embarrassment if you just make the decision unilaterally uh, to do that. And I think it's going to be a problem for you. I think that you would be wise to have everybody involved in that process because I think that you're going to find later on as we continue to subpoena people and to bring them in, a lot of mistakes might be made. 
And I think that we could help you correct some mistakes if you allow us to participate in the process. Maybe there's a piece of information that we might have that would prevent that. So I say to you, Mr. Chairman, and I have a lot of respect for you, and I really feel, though, that you're moving in the wrong direction and you're going down the wrong road with this. I think that it was pointed out earlier that if we weren't going to do anything here, we need to make certain that whatever the product comes out of here, that it has, it's credible. And I think the only way that it's credible is that everybody has an opportunity to participate in the process. And may I finally conclude by saying I was not elected to come here to be a prop. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Who seeks uh, time? Mr. Chairman. Oh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kajorski, my good friend. Recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, two things. I'm directed to you, first of all. When history gets to look at what happened in this year of an investigation of campaign finance reform, I would hope that the Thompson Glenn examination in the Senate is a corollary to the Burton Waxman examination in the House. As we are proceeding down this road, it appears to me that this will be the Burton investigation and having no semblance of bipartisanship. Now, to go to an analogy, I want to talk about two issues, the scope of the investigation and whether or not we're honestly going to get a good scope and how that can be framed. Initially, if you look at the predilection of the chairman, when you, in the budget submission, you talked about a very narrow scope investigation, the executive branch and the president and the White House and the DNC and nothing else. In March, in your draft protocol at that time, you again said, a very narrow examination of the executive branch. In a letter to Mr. Waxman on the 19th of March, you indicated again that you were adamant that this was not going to be a congressional investigation of, of uh, campaign uh, abuse, but narrowly restricted to the uh, executive branch, the White House, and the DNC. And a memorandum of April 7th indicated the same thing. It wasn't until most recently in the suggested protocol that you've now at least said that the scope is going to be enlarged to whatever the jurisdiction of the committee is, and that's still undefined. But we assume you now mean that it's going to include the congressional side and campaign abuses on the congressional side. And incidentally, Mr. Chairman, nine out of ten American people in the New York Times poll, in the CBS poll, the Wall Street Journal poll, want a bipartisan, broad examination of campaign finance reform. Instead, what you are really doing here is if you measure what even some members on your side of the committee have asked for a broader scope, you've defined that scope. If you think of it as a football field, you've now made the sidelines and the goalposts. You've defined that. But in who controls the subpoena power unilaterally, this committee determines who gets the ball. And if you decide that your side is only going to get an opportunity to get the ball, that's the only team that can score or play the game. And basically, that's the analogy I see with this unilateral restriction of subpoena only in the hands of the chairman. Now, I'd go back to what I originally said. Mr. Chairman, you and I are going to leave this chamber sometime, all the members present here. Sometimes when I look at the impeachment committee of uh, Chairman Rodino of New York, I see all these old faces that are no longer among us. Most of us have gone into eternity. This will be an historical occasion. This will really define Chairman Dan Burton of Indiana. I would hope that the chairman take under very serious consideration what the minority side of this committee is asking. Not for special favor, not for restriction, but for fairness, equality, and broad scope. And in order to have a broad scope hearing, regardless of how the definition is laid out, without the cooperation in the issue of subpoenas between yourself and the ranking member on the minority side, you will be able to, or at least appear to be able to, limit the scope and therefore the very validity of this hearing. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his eloquent remarks. And I'd just like to say that uh, I am aware of the historical significance of, of this committee and this investigation, and that's why I am absolutely committed to the fairness doctrine that I talked about earlier. Uh, anyone on this side to seek recognition? Mr. Not, Chairman? Uh, Mr. Chairman? 
Well, Mr. Cox of California is recognized. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I also want to thank uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Waxman, my colleague from California, who spent a considerable amount of time uh, uh, talking with us about this. I think uh, despite the fact that uh, as we write our written partnership agreement, if you will, uh, we've got language problems. The real test of whether we work together in a bipartisan way uh, is going to be how we proceed tomorrow and the next day and the next day in real life. Uh, when I practiced law, uh, I learned uh, uh, early on that you can have the best partnership agreement in the world, but if the partners don't get along, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, and contrary-wise, uh, if the partners are getting along, it doesn't much matter what your partnership agreement says. Uh, that chart up there uh, purports to represent that uh, in the Watergate Committee, the Iran-Contra Committee, the Whitewater Committee, and so on, there was not uh, a protocol uh, such as we have here. Uh, but that actually proves more than is at issue because uh, there's not been a protocol of any kind uh, in any of these investigations before. This is the first time in 200 years uh, that we will have adopted a protocol. Uh, the rules permit the chairman the authority to issue subpoenas, always have. Uh, when I worked in the White House, I was certainly on the receiving end of many subpoenas that were issued uh, by committee chairmen without votes of their committee. It happens all the time. It's happened in the 103rd Congress repeatedly uh, the last time I served in the minority. Uh, but the difference in this instance is that uh, because the minority uh, protested, uh, went to the parliamentarian and insisted that we go through this procedural mechanism, we are now for the first time adopting a protocol. The procedure that's been informally in place has been one, uh, both in previous Congresses and in this one under Chairman Burton, pursuant to which the minority members, not just the ranking member, but any minority member, uh, has the opportunity to discuss the scope of the subpoena in advance before it's issued. Uh, and uh, the minority has elected uh, to boycott that procedure and instead uh, protest and put us through this drill to get a protocol. But we don't have to do that. Uh, and regardless of whether we're unsatisfied with the language in this protocol today, uh, we still have the opportunity on every single subpoena uh, to work together to narrow the scope if the minority wishes to do so, uh, to change subpoenas in any way. And I personally have an interest in doing that. Uh, but having been, as I said, on the receiving end when I worked in the White House Counsel's Office of subpoenas that I thought were overbroad on a regular basis, uh, or of uh, document requests and demands and so on, uh, I think we need to be appropriately sensitive uh, to concerns that the executive branch has uh, about uh, the breadth of these subpoenas, what we're asking for, and whether uh, uh, it's appropriate to the ends of our investigation. Well, the gentleman yields. I'm, I'm just about finished. I'd be happy to yield. Uh, uh, and I think that all of the comments that people have been making about uh, uh, prior investigations of this uh, gravity, uh, referring, for example, to the Watergate investigations as several people on both sides have this morning, uh, ought to remind us of something else. Uh, yes, uh, uh, this hearing will test the mettle not just of our chairman but of every member on both sides. Uh, but it's not just a majority venture here to be bipartisan, it's also uh, a minority venture. And if you think about why that Watergate hearing worked so well, uh, I think one big reason was that uh, uh, the leader on the minority side was somebody like Howard Baker. Uh, I got a chance to work for Howard Baker at the end of the Reagan administration when he was chief of staff. He's a remarkable man. And I think the challenge for, for all of us, certainly all on the minority side, is whether we can rise to the occasion and be as good as Howard Baker was in that role. And if that's possible, then I don't think there's any limit to our capacity to cooperate on these things, to reach agreement on the issuance of every single subpoena. And, and I, as an individual member, uh, frankly, intend to become more involved, certainly as the vice chairman of the committee, I'd like to become more involved uh, in the issuance of these subpoenas before they go out. Uh, I'd like to work with the member from California, my colleague, uh, Mr. Waxman, in that, and we've had the opportunity to discuss that privately. But I'd also like to alert every member on the majority side and on the minority side that we have this opportunity, that the staff has told me that if it has to go beyond the 24-hour formal notice period, they're happy to work with us on that, uh, and that uh, uh, in a spirit of bipartisan cooperation, we really can 
uh, do this together. And that's uh, certainly my hope, my expectation, and uh, I have some confidence based on the conversations that uh, we've been able to have with uh, Mr. the ranking member that would the gentleman uh, yield for a really question? do this down the road. Would uh, the gentleman yield for a question? And I appreciate all that, that I think that, that I've heard you say. Do you know why there have been 100 subpoenas issued thus far without any concurrence by the minority? I mean, I hear you saying that, well, we need to work together and that you'd like to see us work together, and it doesn't matter what the protocol says. But up to this point, do you, do you have any idea why that hasn't worked? Well, yes, as I said, uh, while the procedure has been in place for the minority to comment on these, and they've all been provided to the minority in advance, we haven't had any comments on any of these subpoenas. Uh, so now in the Senate, it's been a, an effective boycott of the procedure, and right. that's why we're okay. being put to this drill of having to approve a protocol and so on. There was a protest of the parliamentarian and so on. The, the, the way that now it needs to work is uh, cooperatively, and that means there has to be right. additional, you know, So you agree then that sides. there should be concurrence of the minority in the issuance of any subpoena? Uh, I think that that's the chairman's intent for the issuance it's of It's not all what the words say. Though. Only the exceptional case uh, uh, will we have to go to the drill of... Uh, a full committee vote. Isn't that what your colleague from California's amendment says then, that in exceptional cases the chairman could act, but normally it should be concurrence? Well, as a matter of fact... Uh, That's exactly what this amendment says. My point is that you can't have concurrence if we have a procedure, as we do now, in place that not only permits but invites the cooperation of the minority, and the minority doesn't exercise the right when they're consulted uh, to comment on There's the nothing in the procedure now that gives the minority the opportunity to have to concur or to force a committee vote. Though. You would agree with that, right? You're saying we should get over that. Well, and, and neither has there been in any of these investigations up here or in the 104th Congress it, or in the 103rd you, such a protocol. I heard you say that earlier. You would agree that it's been the practice thus far in the Congress that always there's been a concurrence. Yes, and that is precisely what's being always offered Always, the there has been practice. the opportunity for the minority the identical to concur. practice is being offered here. And up until now in this investigation, that hasn't been the case, but you don't really have an explanation. No, up in this Congress, the practice it is intended will be exactly the same. But thus far, you asked me a specific fact question, why in the issuance of subpoenas thus far has there not been yeah, uh, minority concurrence? And the answer the is that field, after having provided the subpoenas to the minority side in advance before they were issued, uh, the minority elected uh, to boycott that procedure. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we have gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Sanders, is recognized. Would the gentleman just yield for one minute so I can respond yes, to that issue? Yes, happy to yield. Uh, we're, we're faced with a situation, I want to clarify this for the gentleman from Pennsylvania particularly, because he raised an important point. We're asked to concur on the issue of subpoenas. And when we've objected to those issuance of subpoenas, we're told that they'll go ahead anyway. We have no ability to ask the members to consider whether it's appropriate. In effect, I get to talk to Mr. Burton and, to, and see if I can influence him. Well, I don't think that's the appropriate role for the chairman of the committee. This is the committee's investigation. And if we don't concur, then we ought to take our dispute to the full committee and let all the members decide. So um, there's no appropriate protocol for the protection of information, and there's no appropriate uh, protocol that gives us our minority rights to make our case, even to a majority Republican committee. And if they're afraid to let the majority of the Republicans even vote on this issue, then you know there's a reason that they must have to fear the openness and, uh, uh, and right of the committee to act. Thank you for your Reclaiming my time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, uh, I am the only independent in the Congress and, by definition, the only independent on this committee. In fact, Atia was re-elected by defeating both a Republican and a Democrat. So I look at nonpartisanship, perhaps, in a little different way than anyone else does. And what concerns me very much is that the work that we are undertaking is, in fact, very, very important work. And to pick up on the point that Mr. Lantos made a few moments ago, my fear is that our work will lack the credibility that it deserves unless we go forward in a nonpartisan way. If there is a vote in a few minutes which is divided by the parties and you win by a few votes, the perception, the correct perception that the American people will pick up is that what we're looking at 
as an attack by the Republican Party against the White House and the President of the United States of America. Now, I happen to believe that the American people are concerned about much of what they're reading about in the White House, and they should be concerned. But I also believe that one has got to be very, very naive to think that the American people think that the only problem that exists in terms of campaign fundraising and the implications of that rest with the White House and the Democrats, and that the American people are not equally concerned about much of what they are reading about in terms of corporate influence over the Republican Party and legislation that has been brought forth. If we are serious about really addressing the issue that the American people are worried about, and that is the influence of big money on both political parties and on all of us, then I think we have to go forward in a non-partisan way. And if we do that, Mr. Chairman, we can serve an enormously important role in the current moment of American history. All over this country, from Vermont to California, people are saying there is something wrong with how the White House and members of Congress, Republicans, Democrats, independents, have to raise money in order to get elected. Now, if we go forward in a partisan way and the Republicans keep eking out their votes by a few votes, people will say, hey, all you got is one more partisan witch hunt, same old stuff. But if we go forward together and we say, yes, we're concerned about the White House, yes, we're concerned about what's happening in Congress, yes, let's address the disgrace of how all of us have to raise money to get elected, do you know what, Mr. Chairman? We will have played a very, very important role in American history, and the American people will look upon what we are doing here in a very, very positive light. Will the, the chairman yield? yield? I would be happy to yield to Mr. Lantos. Uh, thank Mr. you. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Lantos. allow me, with, uh, with all due respect, to pose a direct question to you. On both sides, we have had some very eloquent and very moderate and reasonable arguments. Would you do us the favor, and would you do the American people the favor, to explain substantively what you object to in the procedure that historically all investigative committees have used? Namely, you obtain the concurrence of the ranking minority member or you obtain a vote in the committee. What is wrong with that procedure? The uh, Committee on Government Reform and Oversight in the past under Chairman Klinger had the same authority that I have right now. And uh, if the gentleman would yield further, I would hope that he would yield to my colleague who is the chairman of the International Operations Committee because I believe they have the same authority right with now. With all due respect, Mr. Chairman, you haven't answered my question. My question is, what is your specific substantive objection to the amendment, namely that you get the concurrence of the ranking minority member or failing that you get a vote of the committee on which you have a majority? Well, I, I don't intend, nor do I think uh, Mr. Waxman, if he were chairman, I don't intend to restrict the power that the committee chairman has at this present time. And I don't think any chairman who has that power would do that. I think it's important that you consult with the minority and make sure that they're well aware of what's going on and ask for their input. I have done that with Mr. Waxman on every occasion. Every subpoena that has been sent out, which has been preceded by a letter in most cases to the person who was going to receive the subpoena, has been given to Mr. Waxman at least 24 hours ahead and of has time. Has he concurred? Well, of course he hasn't. <laughs> Always, obviously, there's some concern that he has in some areas. But okay. that, that, I won't get into that. Mr. All Chairman, I say, if I could read. All I could say is that Mr. Waxman has been made aware of the subpoenas and correspondence that's been going out, and we continue to try to be as fair as possible and as open as possible with the minority. Mr. Chairman, if reclaiming my time, I, I would just simply conclude by saying this. What we're engaged in is important business. It is of enormous consequence. If the end result of the effort is that the American people perceive that the Republicans in control of this committee launched a one-sided attack against the White House, that would be very, very unfortunate because there is so much important work that we have got to undertake in terms of the abuse of campaign finance on the Congress 
and on the whole process. We have an enormous opportunity to expose all over the place the problems that exist, and I would hope that we could go forward in a nonpartisan way. The gentleman, you? The gentleman's I time has expired. Mr. Gilman, gentlemen, the chairman of the International Operations Committee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, pursuant to your request, I just verified with the Council on our committee uh, that in issuing subpoena power to the chairman, uh, no concurrence was required, nor was concurrence required in issuing subpoena power to the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, to the Small Business Committee, and to others. Uh, I would hope, though, that you would continue in your efforts, Mr. Chairman, uh, to uh, uh, confer with the uh, uh, ranking minority member and to see if you can get some uh, consensus and some uh, cooperation in, in issuing uh, subpoenas, as I know you've tried to do in the past. I think this should be a bipartisan effort, and whatever we can do to encourage it, and I would try to encourage a ranking minority member to cooperate with the chairman uh, in these instances with regard to issuance of subpoenas. Thank you, Mr. Gentleman uh, from New York, yield to me. I'd be pleased to yield the gentleman. Uh, I appreciate your yielding, and I didn't get the, an opportunity to uh, uh, have uh, our one independent uh, member of the committee uh, yield to me, and uh, I, I respect his position, and, and there should be a, a nonpartisan, not just a bipartisan investigation. It should be conducted fairly, and we should use precedent. But I, I submit, too, again, uh, if, and, and let me clarify one thing since I have a moment that uh, what the gentleman from West Virginia spoke to as far as uh, protocol uh, related to uh, deposition of uh, witnesses under Rule 19, and that's comparing apples and oranges. The gentleman, well, the gentleman yields since he used here. my name in debate. Uh, I, I'm just re responding to what you responded Well, if the gentleman to, would permit me to respond yeah, to an inaccurate statement, I'd gentleman appreciate it. New York my, uh, the gentleman from New York would yield since the gentleman he yielded to use my name in debate. Uh, uh, I'm yield, I've yielded time to, the, uh, to Mr. Micah. And again, uh, the gentleman from uh, West Virginia, I think, did uh, refer to uh, comments that I had made previously. So I uh, wanted to make that comment. And also, if, if you look at the precedent here, we don't need to, to adopt a protocol. Uh, the chairman is adopting a protocol. Under the leadership of the, uh, uh, chair, uh, uh, of the chairman of a former uh, subcommittee, who is now the ranking member, uh, he was the chair of the Subcommittee on Health and Environment, they held 11 hearings before any document protocol was established in the tobacco matter that I mentioned. That they unilaterally establish a document protocol without a vote. They establish a doc document protocol without conducting any subcommittee hearings or meetings and without consulting the minority. That they issued two reports at the conclusion of the investigation without minority consultation and without a vote of the committee. And that they required a vote of documents uh, deemed, quote, confidential. However, the chairman chose in that instance to have unilateral authority to decide what was and what was not un confidential. And that they released documents at subcommittee hearings without committee vote, consultation, or without the co uh, concurrence of the minority. So we should use precedent. And I don't want to be unfair the way they were unfair to us. And I believe that uh, we should pr proceed uh, with a protocol that uh, does set forth these points and at the beginning in a fair manner in which Chairman Burton has brought before us. Thank you. And I Mr. Yield back. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fatah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let, let me just say that um, it is of note. Uh, my colleague talked earlier about the newspaper articles. Just, just in today's newspapers, there's evidence that the United States Senate is operating slightly differently. They've issued subpoenas to Republican-related uh, groupings, um, and there are, uh, and they've also issued subpoenas in reference to the Dole campaign. And there's an article in the Wall Street Journal today uh, talking about a, a process in which uh, advisors help move uh, maximum contributions uh, through various PACs to individual uh, congressional and Senate campaign uh, campaigns, that it would seem to me that our investigative staff would not just, uh, if they just would look at 
just what the facts are available would not end up with a situation where we have a hundred subpoenas issued all to democratic groups when obviously on its face there are some other allegations that should be explored. Um, I recall uh, the chairman of uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, stating on national television that he was briefed that the, that the allegation in re reference to the uh, Chinese influence was related to the Chinese government trying to influence congressional and state legislative campaigns. Uh, so it would seem to me that if our interest is in trying to track these allegations down, that we are not, uh, at least up until now, following a course that would lead us in the direction of getting to the facts. We should broaden the scope. We should have a fair process for the issuance of subpoenas. And that process, at least in the amendment that is before us now, is not a, a, a process in which the chairman would be handcuffed from issuing subpoenas unilaterally. All it suggests is that in the normal course of business, the chairman should seek the concurrence of the minority. If that concurrence is not available, then he should seek the vote of the committee in which the majority has the votes to move its uh, issues forward, but that he should not act uh, on his own. And I think that all of us, once this vote is taken, if we go down a path of having unilateral submission of subpoenas, are going to regret it. We are going to be embarrassed by it, and the chairman is going to be embarrassed by it. We should have a process in which there are more minds at work than just the, what will affect be the chairman's staff, not even the chairman himself, because we know how this process works. So we should create a set of dynamics in which the committee, which is going to be held accountable for what takes place, is something that we can all be prepared to stand up and be accountable for. The gentleman is glad to yield. The gentleman's time, the gentleman's time, has, the gentleman's time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. I move the previous question. Mr. Chairman. The Mr. previous Chairman. question has been Mr. moved. Chairman. The, Mr. Chairman. Que the previous question has been moved. It's non-debatable. The question now comes on the motion of the gentleman from Mr. Indiana. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, you passed over Ms. Maloney and I. We would like to be heard on this issue, please. If you're talking I, I, about fairness, this is the place to start right now. The motion is on the floor. It's non -debatable. Fairness, this is the place to start right now, Mr. Chairman. This the is the vote on fairness. Mr. Chairman, I thought the rule was to get over two members. members right here, Mr. Chairman. We're asking to be recognized. Is this a debatable motion, Mr. Point Chairman? of parliamentary procedure. The gentleman is recognized on his point of order. Are we interrupting a debate where members are discussing such an important issue by trying to close off the debate and not let people speak? The fact of the matter is the debate's been going on. I move to adjourn, time. Mr. Chairman. And a motion I move to adjourn. A motion is on the floor. The previous question has been Mr. Ordered. Chairman, move, I move to adjourn. Point that is the most privileged the motion. Clerk, if this clerk, is going to be a kangaroo court, we should the, get out of here right now. The, the, point the, of order. The gentleman is out of order. The clerk will point, call the point roll. Of order. That is a priv Mr. Point Martin, of order. Point of order, point of order Mr. Gentleman Chairman. will state his point of order. The most privileged the motion is the motion for, to adjourn. I have moved to adjourn. The gentleman for a motion to adjourn, and that does take a higher priority than any other matter pending before the committee. Until that motion is dispensed with, uh, we cannot go forward with any other vote. We, we have been informed. We have been informed by the parliamentarian that the, the previous question has been ordered, the vote has been called. If there is a motion that you'd like to make after the previous question, the chair will entertain it. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Aye. Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Hastert? Aye. Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Aye. Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Shays? No. Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Aye. Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Aye. Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Aye. Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Aye. Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? No, sorry, Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Scarborough votes aye. Mr. Shattuck? Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. La Tourette? Aye. Mr. La Tourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Aye. 
Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Aye. Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Shes Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Snowbarger? Aye. Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Portman? Aye. Mr. Portman votes aye. Mr. Waxman? Mr. Waxman? Mr. Waxman, pass. Mr. Lantos? Pass. Mr. Lantos, pass. Mr. Wise? Pass. Mr. Wise, pass. Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns, pass. Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Chairman, it is my understanding that the minority has inquired of the parliamentarian of the House, and the parliamentarian has instructed the minority that unless the vote was in process, Mr. Kanjorski? It was not in process. And, and the order or the request for a motion to adjourn was in precedent over the uh, uh, motion. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I just want to say this is th th to start. Mr. Chairman, can we have uh, regular order, please? Regular order. <clears throat> Mr. Kanjorski? Part of the integrity being impugned as well. Pass. Mr. Kanjorski, pass. Mr. Condon? Mr. Sanders? Pass. Mr. Sanders, pass. Mrs. Maloney? Pass. Mrs. Maloney, pass. Mr. Barrett? No. Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? Pass. Ms. Norton votes pass. Mr. Fatah? Pass. Mr. Fatah, pass. Mr. Holden? Mr. Holden, pass. Mr. Cummings? Yes. Mr. Cummings, pass. Mr. Kucinich? Pass. Mr. Kucinich, pass. Mr. Blagojevich? Pass. Mr. Gavlojevich, pass. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Pass. Mr. Davis from Illinois, pass. Mr. Tierney? No. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? Pass. Mr. Turner, pass. Mr. Allen? Pass. Mr. Allen, pass. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. McIntosh? Mr. McIntosh votes yes. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Fatah, you're recorded as pass. Uh, I like to be recorded as a no. Mr. Fatah, no. Mr. Chairman? Gentleman from California. May I inquire how I'm recorded? Mr. Waxman, you're recorded as pass. Mr. Chairman, I want to change that to an emphatic no on cutting off the debate and letting us have a full discussion. Gentleman does not need to explain his vote. It's a no. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California. How am I recorded? Mr. Lantos, you're recorded as pass. Uh, I wish to vote no on this gag rule. Mr. Lantos Ms. votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Gentleman from West Virginia. Mr. Wise is recorded as pass. I wish to be recorded as voting no. Mr. Wise votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Kanjorski is recorded as pass. Mr. Chairman, I wish to uh, vote no. Gentleman votes no. Mr. Sanders. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Sanders, you're recorded as pass. The chairman, we were told, trust us, we're going to be fair, and now debate is cut off. I vote no. Mr. Gentlemen Sanders votes, votes no. no. How am I recorded? Mrs. Maloney, as pass. I wish to uh, vote no on this gag rule. Ms. Maloney votes no. Gentlelady votes no. How am I recorded? Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett is recorded as no. I will remain no on the gag rule. Ms. Norton? May I inquire how am I recorded? Ms. Norton, you're required as, recorded as pass? I vote no. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Holden? Mr. Holden is pass. Well, I wish to vote no. Mr. Holden votes no. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Cummings? I wish to inquire how I'm recorded. Mr. Cummings is pass. I vote no on this gag rule. Gentlemen votes no. Mr. Towns, you're recorded as pass. I 
vote no on this gentlemen, gag rule. I was not sent here to Gentlemen, do votes no. <coughs> Clerk uh, will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, Point of order. I recorded. Mr. Chairman, there are 21 A's and 14 Point A's. Point of order. Point of order. The roll call hasn't been completed. The gentleman will state his point of order. That the roll was called before the uh, uh, roll call was completed. That the tally was called before the roll call was we, completed. We, 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 if, if the gentleman wants to be recorded, we have no objection to that. However, I looked down the dais and I found nobody holding up their hand or indicating a change in the vote. Would Look the gentleman there. state? Gentleman, Mr. Kinchenik, one is... Uh, Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Kinchenik, you're recorded as pass. I wish to record my vote as no. Gentleman votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Bogoyevich, you're recorded as pass. Mr. Chairman, far be it for me to pass on an opportunity to change my vote. I'd like to be recorded as a no. Gentleman votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Davis, you're recorded as pass. I then change my vote to no. Gentleman votes no. Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? On the gag rule. Mr. Tierner, Tierney, you're recorded as no. That's appropriate. We'll Gentleman votes way. no. Next. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be recorded as no. Mr. Turner is recorded as a no. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman, how am I recorded? Mr. Allen, you're recorded as pass. I would like to vote no and hope that in the future, as a freshman, we get to speak on these matters. Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 21 ayes and 19 nays. The motion is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Did the previous did, question, want, Mr. Does the gentleman propose a, 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 a motion or an amendment? I have an amendment at the desk at this time. Previous question has been voted. Regular order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will withhold just for a moment. The vote is now on the amendment of the gentleman from California. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. No. And depending on the chair, the no's have it. I ask a record vote. The gentleman's asked for a record vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gilman? No. Mr. Gilman votes no. Mr. Hastert? No. Mr. Hastert votes no. Mrs. Morella? No. Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Shays? No. Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? No. Mr. Cox votes no. Ms. Ross Layton? No. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Q McHugh votes no. Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Horn votes no. Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. McIntosh? Mr. McIntosh votes no. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Scarborough votes no. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes no. Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sanford votes no. Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sununu votes no. Mr. Sessions? Mr. Sessions votes no. Mr. Pappas? No. Mr. Pappas votes no. Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Snowbarger votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Portman? No. Mr. Portman votes no. Mr. Waxman? Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Aye. Mr. Wise votes aye. Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Condent? Mr. Sanders? Aye. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Aye. Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Aye. Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah, pass. Mr. Holden? Aye. Mr. Holden votes aye. 
Mr. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Bogoyevich? Aye. Mr. Gaboyevich votes aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Aye. Mr. Davis from Illinois votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Turner? Aye. Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Davis from Virginia? Mr. Owens? Mr. Condent? Mr. Fata? Aye. Mr. Fata votes aye. Clerk will vote, report the vote. Mr. Chairman, there are 18 ayes and 23 nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Chairman, point of parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman will state his point of parliamentary inquiry. Point of parliamentary inquiry is this. Uh, I, I'm asking what the process will be of this committee going forward because I sit down here at the end, as you can see. I'm a, I'm a member of a freshman the delegation. The gentleman, the gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Parliamentary inquiry is will, will members who are junior have a chance to speak on the matters that come before this committee in the future? Subject to the rules of the committee and the procedures of the committee, every member will have an opportunity to speak. I have does, a anybody, does anybody have a, a, an amendment? I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, the clerk will report the amendment. On page two in paragraph, on page two in paragraph entitled Procedures for Issuance of Subpoenas, after the last sentence, insert the following. Except in the emergency circumstances as provided in section A2B, the chairman will not issue subpoenas without a committee vote or concurrence of the ranking minority member. On page two in paragraph entitled Issuance of Subpoena without prior notice, in line four, strike, hinder, or compromise, and insert lieu thereof, obstruct. Mr. Chairman. Chairman, if I could be recognized on my amendment, please. Can the gentleman illuminate the committee on how this differs from the previous amendment? I would be more than happy to, Mr. Chairman. Am I allotted the customary five minutes that all members are? Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be more than happy to. Mr. Chairman, like the previous amendment, this amendment sets out a procedure by which either the ranking minority member or the members of this committee could vote on it on a subpoena if there is a problem. It goes beyond that, though, because I felt that the rules or the protocol is, is currently issued, um, leave the language a little loose in those situations where there may be an issuance of subpoenas without prior notice. For that reason, I have stricken the words hinder or compromise and instead inserted the word obstruct. On the merits of the amendment itself, Mr. Chairman, I have to admit I am totally, totally baffled by what is going on here today. I understand that this is a partisan body and that we spend a lot of our time fighting over whether you say tomato or we say tomato or you say potato and, and we say potato. But I think there are certain times when we have to act like people. And I think there are certain times when fundamental rules and fundamental rules of fairness come into play. Let me just take a minute and go through the past investigations and let's talk a little bit about fundamental rules of fairness and how they apply there. For example, Senator Thompson, in the Senate investigation of this matter, cannot unilaterally issue a subpoena. He must obtain either the concurrence of the ranking minority member or a committee vote. That, Mr. Chairman, is fundamental fairness. Second, in the Senate Whitewater investigations, sub subpoenas could only be authorized by the committee or by the chairman with agreement of the ranking member. Again, fundamental fairness applied in that investigation. Third, the Council for the Iran-Contra Select Committee confirmed that the chairman did not issue subpoenas in its investigation without concurrence of the minority. Why was that? They were interested in fairness. Fourth, during House Committee, during House Committee on Government Reform and Oversight investigations under Democratic leadership, subpoenas were issued only after agreement by the chairman and ranking member or committee vote. Even Chairman Klinger agreed to amend the committee rules to provide, quote, that the chairman shall not authorize and issue a subpoena for a deposition without the concurrence of the ranking minority member of the committee. Fifth, most House committees also restrict this authority. 
Six, during the House Judiciary Committee's investigation of President Nixon, subpoenas were issued either jointly by the, committee, by the chairman and the minority ranking member or by committee or subcommittee vote. Mr. Chairman, we're talking about fairness. Mr. Sessions says we should be playing on a bipartisan basis. That's like telling your little brother, we're going to play baseball, you always stand in right field and I'll always hit to you. That's like telling someone, let's play football, I'll always carry the ball. If you're interested in fairness, then you'll do what Mr. Fatah was saying. You'd put the rules into play. I, I am just totally baffled as to why on an issue where, frankly, you've got the Democrats bat peddling, you're going to take this issue and you're going to allow us to pound you on how unfair you are because you are totally unfair. Maybe the senators are smarter than members of the House of Representatives. Maybe that's why they recognized that in order to have any credibility with the American people on this issue, they could not have a witch hunt. But for some reason that is unknown to me, people in this body are interested in having a witch hunt. And I, I honestly think that the American people can see through this. If you want to have a fair hearing, then you start out by being fair. If you want to have a witch hunt, then you go exactly the direction you're going today. You go down this road, you cut off members from debate, you don't give us the opportunity to even look at whether the subpoenas are fair. I sat through hearings last session where we had five or six members of the White House Travel Office who were treated unfairly. Everyone on this committee felt they were treated unfairly. You know why we felt that way? Because they were human beings. They were human beings who were forced to incur legal expenses because someone had treated them unfairly and they had to hire a defense attorney and incur costs. So what did we do? We said, we will pay your attorney's fees. What are we doing today? We are telling people, you are subpoenaed. If they think that's an unfair subpoena, what do they do? They either comply with an unfair subpoena or they face criminal contempt. That's criminal contempt where they can go to prison. That means if they are treated unfairly or if there was a mistake, a human mistake where the wrong person got a subpoena, that person has to hire a defense attorney and spend thousands of dollars out of their own pocket in order to defend themselves. Does the majority care about those people at all? Not a whit. Because if you cared about the people, you would say, let's set up a process where we can at least have some safeguards. But if you want to continue down the road of this witch hunt, then just keep going, grab your brooms and start going, because this is totally unfair. Again, what blows my mind more than anything is that this is an issue where you have the upper hand. I understand on the floor where there's nothing going on that, that you want to find excuses to do something else. But this is the issue you should be on the offensive for. But to come in to this room and have just a total charade it, it just defies logic to me. Well, I, I just yield, totally miss well, it. Yield. I'll, I'll yield to yep. the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Barrett. Mr. Chairman, I heard the chairman say that the reason he didn't want to address these amendments on, on the issue of suspending was to preserve the prerogative of the chair. And in a legislative body, that is vitally important in some occasions. But may I call the chairman's attention to the fact of what the effect of a subpoena is. It is the most intrusive power a government can exercise on a private individual. It restricts that person's liberty and invades that person's privacy. And it would seem to me that in an instance like this where hundreds of subpoena, 100 subpoenas have already been issued, and since the majority, the chair, is part of the majority, the only issue that we're re resolving here or asking to be resolved is that some concurrence and investigation occur by the ranking member to assure the freedom, the liberty, and the privacy of some of the objects of these subpoenas. And it would seem to me that it's the great party of Lincoln that should be standing up for <coughs> the protection of privacy and individual rights. What has happened in the Gentleman's time Congress? Has the gentleman's time has expired. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Yeah, Davis. Thank you. I just, just to clarify a couple of things, a criminal contempt motion has to be voted by the whole House. That does not automatically Will issue the gentleman yield? Promise. I'd be happy would, to. Would you agree that if you were served with a criminal contempt motion, you would hire an attorney? Or would you wing it? I think it's going to depend on the circumstance. I can't claim in my time. <laughs> like, like whether you were living in reality or not would be the time. circumstances. Well, I, I, think, I think it was a misstatement. The, the reality is that any criminal contempt citation has to be voted 
generally out of this committee procedure and then by the whole House. And we faced this, I might recall, a year ago when we were going through the White House files. And it was only. General Deal, that's exactly and, and the point the FBI I was making. Files. That's exactly the point you, I was the, making. Gentlemen, you would not yield to me when I asked a minute ago. Please let me make my comment. I think at that point, we heard a lot of opposition on the other side to any criminal contempt. And it was only after that we found out about the FBI files uh, that, that had been looked at by Mr. Livingood and others. And, and so uh, I, I think at this point the record is, is very clear about <clears throat> that criminal contempt has to be voted out by the whole House, and no one's rights are abrogated in that respect. Would well, the gentleman, gentleman yield, yield gentleman for one moment? back to balance of his time. Mr. Chairman. Uh, who have I not recognized? The, gen the gentlelady, Ms. Maloney, is recognized. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I support my colleague's uh, amendment, Mr. Barrett. And I would like to yield time <coughs> to any member. <coughs> I'd like to yield time to any of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that can cite any example, any instance, when this procedure that the chairman wants, which is unprecedented, that of issuing a subpoena unilaterally has ever been exercised and used by a committee chairman in the House of Representatives. I yield to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to give a specific example. I'd like... I, I'm happy to give my colleagues on the other side of the aisle as much time we, as we, they we. want I'll to come happy. forward with a specific example of this unprecedented power to issue a unilateral subpoena. We, we have being exercised, being used. So the gentle, if the gentlelady would yield, uh, we have... I would always yield for the chairman. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, we have four committees of the House right now that have that ability and that... Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, please, that's not the question. I'm aware of that. That's been discussed. I'm only asking, well, I'll, I'll Mr. Chairman, respectfully, I want a specific okay. example, right. an example, an right. instance. I, I will. On four different occasions, Mr. Klinger unilaterally issued subpoenas on the file gate. On four different occasions. August 96th, violation of Rule 19B. It was, it was in violation of Rule 19B in August. Can you cite any other example? Well... All I can tell you is we're not sure how many, but we can tell you that there were unilateral subpoenas issued by the Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, that was four, and he violated a rule then. You want to change the rules. And Mr. Chairman, you have a hundred. Mr. Chairman, you have a hundred unilateral subpoenas issued, unprecedented in this House. You don't have an example, Mr. Chairman, except for your own. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Will the gentlelady yield? Most certainly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Klinger, who was a very honorable chairman, did not violate any rules when he issued those subpoenas, and he did issue them unilaterally. There is precedent, and there's four other committees that do it right now. Gentlelady, yield to me. Can you, can you cite, Mr. Chairman, any example of a Democratic chairman issuing unilaterally these subpoenas? In the last 200 years. The gentlelady might be surprised to know that I don't follow the Democrats all that much. Uh -huh. can, so, any member, no, can any member give an example? Now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask you, can you give an example in the Senate of any Republican chairman who issued unilaterally subpoenas? In the last 200 years. The silence is deafening. Will the gentlelady yield? Only if you give me a specific example. Do you have a specific example? I have a question of the chairman. Uh, I will not yield. Okay. I, I, want, I want, at the end of my time, I will yield. Well, one question, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm going to act bipartisan. 
I'm not going to gag like the chairman did. I'm going to be bipartisan and yield to the Good. gentleman Thank and allow him a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's just one question. Has there been any objection by the ranking minority member of any of the subpoenas that have been issued thus far? Not that I know of. We've given them uh, 24 hours notice, and in most cases, they didn't even want to respond. Has there been any objection, sir? No, 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 no. no objections. This is, a, this is an embarrassment. If the gentlelady will yield to me. I will definitely yield. Because I want the record clear. We objected to every one of those subpoenas because there has not been a protocol in place. There has not been a set of ground rules to protect the confidentiality. And so we have been informed of the subpoenas, yes, and we've objected to all of them. Let the record be clear. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman. They, this chairman is asking for, for more power than any man in America. They're asking for unprecedented powers to issue subpoenas unilaterally and to disclose information unilaterally. That has never, ever happened before. And I'd like to say to my, my good friend, Mr. Barr, how would you feel that if this happens and if the Democrats are ever in power again and they decide to subpoena the NRA? I would like to ask my colleagues, how would you feel if Henry Waxman, they, a lot of people have talked about his investigations of the cigarette companies, how would you feel if he unilaterally went out and subpoenaed private industry, a hundred different uh, subpoenas to cigarette factories? It is unprecedented. It is wrong. And I've heard many of my colleagues say, and you say that this is partisan on our side, but I, I have a stack of editorials that I want to put in to the record that opposes it, and a stack of statements from nonpartisan groups, the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, Citizens Union, Ross Perot's group, the Reform Party, all of them have come out strongly, strongly objecting to what the, pre the, the chairman is asking for. Why don't you do what the senator, your Republican colleague, is doing on the Senate side? The He's not. Gentlelady's time Moving has forward like this, I would just... The gentlelady's time has expired. The, I'm sorry. The gentlelady's chairman. time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm disappointed in your gag rule. I'm the, disappointed the in, in this attempt. The uh, gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, Mr. I, I want to restate before I recognize the next member that there is precedent for this. It was done in the past by Mr. Klinger, and it was not a violation of the rules. Mr. Scarborough is recognized. I just want to say very briefly, first of all, I think we are all warmed on this side by the self-righteous glow that is emanating our way. And in fact, I think the last time I was so warmed by such a self-righteous glow... Will had the to gentleman be, yield? No, I won't. ...will be right before we were trying to get a hold of some documents uh, that ended up showing that this administration had improperly seized the FBI, 900 FBI files, possibly for politically pur political purposes. Now, when we were asking for those documents, we were told at the time that this was going to somehow subvert democracy, that it was going to end Western civilization that we knew it, and that we should feel badly about ourselves because locusts would surely descend upon Washington and our home districts if we ever did this. And I guess what I'm seeing is a trend over the past couple years, because I'm new to this, I'm new to politics, is that the other side seems to be more interested in changing the subject than cleaning up the system. And it doesn't matter what issue we're talking about, whether we're trying to find out about how improper money affected policy in Washington, D.C., or how 900 files got improperly seized, there's going to be a new flavor of the month every time, a new outrage to show just how horrible we are for trying to clean up this mess. And, and I've just got to say, I've seen it for a couple of years, and, and I, I regret to say that uh, like the last time, I'm just afraid that some of these arguments are disingenuous and, and partisan. Point of information. Uh, gentleman yield. Gentleman yield. Gentleman yield. Point of information. Uh, gentleman yield. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Point of information. Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Point of Norton information. From the District of Columbia. 
Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, to make two points and then to, to, to ask you a couple of questions because I, I can't, cannot believe that this is a matter that we cannot, um, uh, we cannot resolve. First of all, <clears throat> for the record, I'd like to remind us all that the Senate really did almost proceed in this direction. When we, we say that they are not doing this, the fact is that there were many voices uh, in the other body. Uh, and it was only after some consideration of the consequences that the Senate decided not to go there. I hope we will learn from their reconsideration that this is not the place to go. And I want to remind the chairman that by allowing no vote in effect, he will be casting, cast, casting a proxy for every Republican. Uh, and, and you may carry down a lot of folks with you. Um, you're in the majority, allowing us to vote also allows some of your people, some of whom do not uh, always vote uh, a party line, to indicate their dissent. Uh, and they ought to understand that <clears throat> the, 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 the subpoenas as issued are essentially assigned to them. Mr. Chairman, you indicated, uh, as I heard your opening statement, the only reason you offered uh, for uh, not amending the rule was that there would be uh, a great number of subpoenas and too many to vote on. Uh, Mr. Klinger's practice has been cited, and for the most part, uh, his practice was different with uh, only uh, some violations of the rule and not a great many. Uh, I want to ask you, Mr. Chairman, if it turned out uh, that, uh, that there were not votes in large numbers uh, on each subpoena, would you be willing uh, to use the practice that was used by your predecessor? The Chair will retain the same authority as Chairman Klinger had and previous chairman had, and uh, there will be no change in that. Uh, may I ask one, one other question, Mr. Chairman, then? Uh, I accept your point that the rule has been, was the, the rule you, you proffer is the same rule, uh, but as a matter of practice, uh, the chairman has indeed consulted with the minority. Would you agree to keep the same rule, but as a matter of practice, to consult with the minority in the manner that your predecessor did almost all of the time? Let me just say that I have said publicly, and I've said to Mr. Waxman, the ranking minority member, that on all correspondence pertaining to information and records, all subpoenas, I will give him at least 24 hours notice and will consult with him on whatever subpoenas or documents that he wants to talk about. And I met with him this morning for over two hours. We do have a disagreement, but there's no question that I will be consulting with him and will be as fair as possible with the minority. And if we find strong indications of illegal activity, we will follow that wherever it leads, including on the Democrat side and the Republican side. The chairman misunderstands my question because the, 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 the consultation would, 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 would include the, the, the entire practice that was used by your predecessor, which meant that if there were an objection, a vote would be allowed. And that is, my, that is the heart of my question. Would you use the practice? Would you retain the same rule but use the practice that, for the most part, your predecessor used? We will abide by the rules and regulations adopted by this committee earlier this session rules that were adopted by previous sessions by the previous chairman of this committee and previous committees. Respectfully, Mr. Chairman, I'm simply asking about the practice now. I'm not asking at, the, at this time I, for I, changing I, the rule. I don't want to be redundant, but I've said time and again, I will consult with Mr. Waxman. I have consulted with him. I will inform him in the minority before we send out any subpoenas or any re document requests. He will be fully informed. He will be involved in the loop. And if you have objections and concerns, I will certainly listen to them before we act. May I say, Mr. Chairman, that uh, uh, your responses I find very perplexing. Uh, the reason I find them perplexing is that the committee has the majority. 
And I have served on this committee ever since the committee had the majority. I believe the record will show that there is great discipline uh, on the other side of the aisle in this committee. The chairman would be conceded, conceding very little, therefore, if he conceded that as a matter of practice he would allow such votes, because as a matter of practice, Mr. Chairman, you would win such votes by not even allowing for the possibility no, okay. that you, that you might you. lose a single vote in essence, uh, uh, you are not using your own majority to the best advantage. I yield back the, the balance of the time. The gentlelady yields back the balance of his time. Who seeks time? Uh, on his side. Mr. Kuc Mr. Cummings of Maryland, and then Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, this weekend I had an opportunity to um, watch uh, a town meeting that you were involved in. And I was very moved by the people who came out. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. You mean to tell me you spent an hour and a half listening to me in the town? I sure meeting? did. God bless you, my son. I was, um, and I was very moved uh, by some of the um, people that came out to that town meeting. Um, you had uh, senior citizens and just a, a wide array of folk. And as I sat there and I thought, I looked at it and I said to myself, you know, only in America, only in this great country of ours, can this happen. And, you know, I, I said to myself and I say to myself today that each one of your voters have a tremendous impact on you and they put you here. The voters uh, from the 7th Congressional District of Maryland put me here. And then my vote is very, just as significant as yours. And it pains me. And I, I mean, I, I listen to you. I'm, I've only been on this committee for about a year. But I must tell you that it pains me as a freshman, a sophomore, whatever you want to call it, to sit here and watch this go, this, 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 whatever you want to call it, come about. The freshmen down here, I know they must feel the same frustration. We came to this Congress to make a difference. We came to this Congress not to just, uh, we got on this committee looking at government reform, thought that we would be reforming government, not reforming the Democratic Party, not reforming the Republican Party, but reforming government. And it concerns me that as we are proceeding here today, and the rules, this protocol, and by the way, I understand that this is, a lot of members have made a big uh, argument about the fact that we are now putting it in writing as protocol. But just because it is written does not mean it is right. The fact is, is that we came here to make a difference. Not to sit on our hands, not to act as if we don't count. We do count. And if you don't think that we count, you ask every one of those voters in the 7th Congressional District of Maryland who voted for me, they wanted me to come here and make a difference. Somebody said on the other side a few moments ago, we are supposed to be about the business of cleaning up the system. Well, nobody told me that the system was only Republicans. The system was only Democrats. The system is all of us. This is America. And so I say to you that when you, and there's another point, Mr. Kondorski made a very in, uh, excellent point. I don't know how many of the members of this committee have ever been on the other side of a subpoena. It is not a simple thing. It disrupts people's lives. I practiced criminal law for 20 years. It's, it disrupts their lives. And I would like to think that as a criminal lawyer who came here from Baltimore, who has practiced on the federal, state, and local jurisdictions, that I could have an impact on the subpoenas that go out, that I could have a judgment call on it. But the way we are proceeding, I have no voice. And that upsets me. I look at my ranking member, Mr. Waxman, who says that he's objected to every subpoena. It is interesting to note that every subpoena has still gone out, unless, I, unless somebody corrects me. So the question is, is what does an objection mean when it doesn't mean anything? And so I just pause to say that I have, I have a tremendous amount of frustration, and I hope that, and I listen to Mr. Cox talk about bipartisanship, 
And I like that spirit. But at the same time, to look at what has happened today, this has not been a spirit of bipartisanship. And if we are going to be true to ourselves and true to the American people, I don't care about precedent. I really don't. What I care about is getting to the bottom of this. And it is frustrating. And so I ask you, Mr. Chairman, I, I know you, I, I just sit here in support of this amendment. And I hope that as new members, that you all understand that we, we do have this frustration. We've come, come here to make a difference. And if we're not going to be allowed to make that, uh, that difference, you ought to let us know. And then we'll have to do something else. Thank you very much. I yield Gentleman back the balance. Back balance this time for a unanimous consent request, we recognize Ms. Maloney. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would you like see how nice I really am. I, I appreciate you recognizing me, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to request a unanimous consent to place in the record the uh, statement on this proposed uh, procedure granting unilateral uh, ability to grant to issue subpoenas and, and, and disclose information. Statements from the League of, of Women Voters, Common Cause, the Reform Party, Public Citizen. I would also like to place in the record editorials on this issue from the New York Times, from the Washington Post, uh, from the Hill, uh, from, uh, from the Chicago Sun-Times, from the Wall Street Journal, and the Fort Worth Star. Without objection. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think, uh, I think it might be worthwhile to put aside histrionics and focus, again, as I indicated uh, when I made remarks uh, earlier with regard to uh, Mr. Waxman's First Amendment, the realities of the world, if the members on the other side are truly so very concerned, as the level of their voice would seem to imply, with getting to the bottom of this uh, or finding the truth, then one would really think that they would be supportive of measures that recognize, similar to the measures that we employ in the prosecutorial area, that people who are on the receiving end of subpoenas do not want, generally speaking, to get to the bottom of it. They do not want the truth to get out. They want to evade that result. They almost always employ very high-powered attorneys familiar with how the system can be tied up in knots for the sole purpose of delaying and delaying and delaying. Now, if that's what the folks on the other side want, then I would submit that they are not interested in getting at the truth or getting at the bottom of it, but simply providing a mechanism that does not reflect reality uh, as we know it exists, and want to provide a mechanism here in the Congress that fosters the ability of people to subvert the system and to evade and avoid responding to subpoenas. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Chairman, as I suspect you have realized through both your long service on this committee, as well as upon your assuming the chairmanship thereof, that people to whom subpoenas are directed will do just about whatever it takes to avoid responding to those subpoenas. Well, the gentleman, I suspect George that a great number of the people listed on this magnificent chart that Mr. Waxman has provided for us uh, are not really keen on providing information in response to subpoenas to the Congress of the United States well, of America. The gentleman from Georgia Yale. I suspect that uh, also there are many people who not only will flee the area in which they live or in which the subpoena is served, but perhaps even flee the country in efforts to avoid the subpoenas. They know, many of those people, because they are frequently more familiar with the way that Congress and its committees can be tied up in knots even than the members are, they know that if they have on the House side a mechanism that does not allow for the timely submission of subpoenas and the execution thereof, that they more than likely will almost always be able to find somebody on the other side who will be their champion and who will, at their behest, tie the committee up in knots, refusing to grant consent, refusing to meet, and so on and so forth. Well, the what the chairman Georgia is proposing here for this committee is simply a reflection similar to that that we have used very successfully for generations in the prosecutorial area 
that reflects that there has to be power within an individual to issue subpoenas to do so with a great deal of flexibility. Well, the I would also Georgia. remind the other side that, again, pursuant to the rules of the House, Rule 11 uh, 2B, that the full committee uh, is the only group that can enforce the subpoena. And if there is something that is defective in a subpoena, which apparently is what the other side believes, they, uh, then there is a mechanism in the rule through which we have to go that provides for full committee consideration so that any objections, any defects in that subpoena can be fully aired, will be fully aired, and would be voted on by the committee. So I think there is precisely the sort of mechanism in place that the other side so loudly proclaims they want that does address and provides a safety valve for any sort of hypothetical abuse that there might be. In addition to that, certainly, every person to whom any subpoena is directed, whether it is directed at the behest of one person or 435, through frequently, almost always, as a matter of fact, those high-powered attorneys know that there are all sorts of mechanisms if they truly believe that a subpoena is defective in some way, for them to test it into court, for them to take all sorts of times to tie things up. And I don't think that this Congress, in its search for truth, ought to make those matters worse by tying the hands of the committee, which is precisely what these amendments are intended to do. Witness the fact that Chairman Waxman just categorically, uh, uh, that uh, the ranking member Waxman just categorically says, we don't like any of these subpoenas. Of course, we're not going to uh, consent to any of them. Uh, a knee-jerk reaction if I ever saw one. And that really, I think, speaks much more loudly than the very loud words of the other side. Uh, the, as I think my colleague from uh, Florida said, the, uh, the self-righteous indignation on the other side. I think that we ought to look at this uh, as very practical steps in order that reflect the reality of the world out there and move on about the business of this committee. Well, if the there are any Georgia matters Hill. into which people on the other side think this committee ought to go down the road, nothing we're doing today or that the chairman is proposing that we do today will cut off any further avenues, any other avenues of either substantive review or investigation or further subpoenas. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes the honorable former mayor of Cleveland, Mr. Cassini. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I wanted to say from the outset that I, I do respect the chair. Uh, he and I may have uh, many things we share in common, and there are issues I know that we do agree on. Um, unfortunately, we do not agree on the way we are proceeding here. I believe that uh, we have to respond to the real world, as is witnessed and experienced by the people of the United States. Uh, this is the essence of government of the people, to recognize that we ex that the duties that we exercise are not in a vacuum, but to recognize that we exercise our duties in the historic context of the principles upon which this country is founded, principles of liberty and justice which unify this nation. We have a serious responsibility here in upholding these principles because liberty and justice go hand in hand. Abuses of justice and of the justice process undermine our liberty. This is the w why power is dispersed throughout our government. This is why the American people demand that dispersal of power. Our symbol of justice, the scales, indicate a balance, a fairness. This is what the people will be looking for in this process, whether justice really does exist here, whether there is balance, whether there is a fairness. Lady Justice is blind, impartial in our system of justice. We recognize the need for impartiality. In our system of justice, no one is above the law, and no one is policeman, prosecutor, judge, and jury. There are constitutional protections of habeas corpus. There's a presumption of innocence. There are constitutional protections against unreasonable search and seizure. Prior investigations have been sensitive to this. Such a structured condition granting unilateral power to the chair is ripe for the abuse of power, no matter how honorable the chair is. An abuse which will impeach not the witnesses who would appear before this committee, but impeach this process and the committee itself, and sweep this committee itself 
and its chair, no matter how honorable the chair is, sweep this committee and the chair up in mistrust and scandal. In order to establish the credibility of this process, the entire committee ought to participate in the issuing and the voting for subpoenas and in voting to release privileged and confidential documents. The people of America will be asking, who and why are we not having a vote? Of what is there to be afraid? Is this or is this not still America? We are here representing various constituencies, but together with the consent of the governed, we represent the United States of America, and the consent of this committee is analogous to the consent of the governed. This is America. In this country, we recognize no king. In this country, democracy must be king. Real power belongs to the people. Real power is not the power of the chair. Real power and the power of the chair is only insofar as it respects the tradition of democracy. And given the seriousness of this subject, of campaign finance abuse, and its implication for our democratic system of government, we have as high a responsibility as any other Congressional Investigation Committee has ever had, and perhaps higher, because the subject involves both parties, the subject involves both the Congress and the administration. More is required of us here. Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, I say let us protect the tradition of government, let us protect the institution of Congress, let us protect the credibility of this committee and of the investigation itself, by involving this entire committee in such an investigation. The American people will not accept anything less because this is still America, even inside the Beltway. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his uh, balance of his time. The, the chair now gladly recognizes my good friend from Pennsylvania, Mr. Konjorski, once again for his eloquent words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I, in part, I'd like to respond to the gentleman from Georgia for his edification of a new principle that I did not know existed in the Constitution of the United States, and that is the presumption of guilt when a subpoena is issued. I, I certainly will go back and check whether we practice that type of law in Pennsylvania. But what I would like to call that gentleman's attention to, and the chair, is what we are, not to, what we are talking about here is not some theoretical concept, one of the hundred subpoenas that were served by the majority, by the chairman of this committee, were misdirected and misserved on an individual that had nothing to do with it and has already been put to great cost and abuse. That could have been avoided if there were a, a working agreement between the ranking member and the chairman and if they missed the proposition or there was a disagreement, it could have been brought to this committee, and that individual would not have been embarrassed, disgraced, and put to great expense by the issuance of that subpoena. Now, I think to that individual and to the American people, his liberty, his privacy, should be as important as ours, certainly as important as the prerogative of the chair. I think the American people watching this charade of democracy here, should be astounded to hear that a recipient of a subpoena has a presumption of guilt, that we don't care out of 100 people that were subpoenaed, there was one that was misidentified and improperly subpoenaed by this committee and already denied liberties and, and, and privacy because of that abuse. And we just seem to sit here and say, well, this is a political issue of some sort. Well, I agree with my friends on the lower bench and most recently the mayor in his, his pro presentation. You know, we may all get here through the political process, but while we're here, we're supposed to uphold and defend the document we take an oath to, the Constitution of the United States. Our constituents and the citizens of this country allow us to exercise unusual authority and power of their liberty and their privacy. And for us to, Mr. Chairman, for you to consider this humorous astounds me. I would hope so, Mr. Chairman. I, I think this is very serious, and I will now yield to uh, Mr. Davis of Illinois. Mr. Davis. Thank you, very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that I respect the most about this body 
is the fact that we've learned how to give 435 people the opportunity to participate and to be heard. For a moment today, I experienced some anxiety because it appeared as though some of that may not have happened. It appeared for a moment as though there were individuals who were not going to have the opportunity to be heard. At the risk of sounding redundant, I really didn't come with a proxy. I didn't bring a proxy with me. When I campaigned in the 7th District in Illinois, I said that I would represent the interests of those individuals who elected me. I swore that when I took the oath of office that I would represent the positions of those people. Nine out of ten of them want there to be a fair and impartial investigation. They want an investigation that is not one-sided. They want an investigation that is not narrowly focused, that does not point out only the President of the United States or points out individuals who say that they are Democrats. They want a full and fair look at the process. They don't want to participate, and they don't want me to participate in any activity that would be contrary to the principles of fairness and the principles of democracy. I've been told, Mr. Chairman, that power has a tendency to corrupt and that absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I don't want to participate in any kind of corruption. Therefore, I don't want to see the chairman have absolute power. I would hope that we look seriously at the amendment that has been put before us, that we recognize that we can, in fact, move ahead with honor and with dignity, that we can rid some of the cynicism that people in this country are feeling, and that we can make sure that there is an open process which will give people a good feeling about their government. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity and urge that we move ahead in a fair, impartial, nonpartisan way. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Very eloquent statement, and I, I wish I had your voice. Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to take a, a few moments to talk to uh, all of the members of this committee, all of my colleagues, and indicate that, you know, having just come to this body, I think there was, especially amongst the newer members, a feeling that this was the group this was the year that we were going to break through the sheer politics of government, uh, that we were going to really work to try and see from the new majority how this worked. For so many years, they complained that the way the Democrats ran the House, that this is the time they were going to show us how it was run fairly, show us how it was done. And yet we find that they don't want to enlarge the investigation to review all of the campaign uh, processes for Democrats and Republicans, or for the President, as well as the House and the Senate, Instead, they want to limit it and then in the same breath turn around and tell the Democrats that they want to be partisan, that they somehow want to squelch uh, to review. Uh, that doesn't make sense, uh, Mr. Chairman. Nor does it make sense when my colleague from Georgia tries to introduce a new constitutional concept, not only of the recipient of a subpoena being presumed guilty, but also that expedience is reason enough to put aside uh, the avoidance or avoid checks and balances in this system. I think that we lost a great deal of credibility just moments ago for this whole investigation when, by a strictly party line vote, many people that wanted to speak out on the First Amendment were shut out. And I think that uh, it probably hearkens what we can expect if we continue along this path. People that received these subpoenas, Mr. Chairman, without any checks or balances are real human beings. They're people that then are confronted with the choice of either producing documents that they may feel are confidential or privileged or suffer the consequences of becoming immediately a defendant, a criminal defendant, with all of the trauma that that causes them and their family and all of the expense just to protect their rights as Americans because this group says they don't think their chairman would abuse the power, but they're unwilling to put in the protocol the language that they say their chairman would abide by anyway. 
Let me put a face on it, Mr. Chairman. We could have avoided had we had some checks and abuses, had we had some participation from others on this committee. We could have avoided a situation where just weeks ago a subpoena was sent out to two banks for the personal banking records of a prominent Asian American in this country who happens to live in this area, who happens to be somebody that is really respected, who left China in the late 1940s to flee communism, who's been a citizen of this country since the early 60s, who attended school here, has even instructed high members of the government in this country. He's a person that believed Asian Americans should be greater participants in the political process, a process from which he thought Asian Americans have long been excluded. He fled communism in China. He's a staunch anti-communist. He settled in this country because he believed that our country had a democratic system. This person contributed financially to President Bush in the 80s, and in January of 1996, he and his wife both contributed substantial sums to Senator Dole in the presidential campaign because, as he said, he liked President Clinton, but he also liked Dole. This individual had occasion to meet a fundraiser that the majority would like to inquire further into. He met him at a senator's retirement party in the early part of the year. That fundraiser asked our individual if he would attend a special Asian American fundraising dinner in early February, which he did for the president, purchased tickets. These people talked for maybe five minutes, Mr. Chairman. This individual and his wife made subsequent contributions to the Democratic National Committee and to other Democratic candidates in 1996 from their own funds. These contributions were made because he thought his prior association with the president and his belief that Asian Americans should participate in the political process were things he wanted to follow up on. Over the years, he made other uh, contributions. There's no indication anywhere that this person did anything improper, that the money that was contributed was not his own or that it came from any foreign sources. There's no indication that this person had any other dealings with that fundraiser other than that one occasion. And clearly that brief contact does not merit the Republican staff invading his privacy and improperly pr and prying into his personal banking records. When he was informed that the subpoenas for these personal banking records had been issued, he was stunned in disbelief, stating that nothing like this had ever happened to call his good name in question or his reputation in question this person said that he couldn't believe that it was happening in a democratic society or that it was happening in the United States of America. Mr. Chairman, this is the posing of some serious, serious questions. Why won't the majority allow the checks and balances that could avoid this kind of an attack on Americans? Why isn't there some check and balance to make sure that the personal banking records of distinguished United States citizens are not being made just on the basis of Asian surnames, which we certainly hope isn't true? What is your staff going to do to assure us that they won't go out on this tangent, Mr. Chairman? Because if we put aside even any question of this chairman or any other chairman's temperament or motives or personal conflicts that might be alleged, we put that aside. We need assurances that we can have some checks and balances on staff. Just one view of today's Wall Street Journal article calling into question some of the staff on this committee would want us all, I should think, to have the proper checks and balances in place where the committee would be the ones behind the subpoenas, behind the fairness that would go out so that Americans, no matter what their background ethnically, or for whatever country they came from, would truly be treated like Americans. Mr. Chairman, that's the challenge, not to be political, not to say that we've got the votes, watch us run and steamroll over the other party. The challenge is let's have an open and fair process. Let's bring to the American people all of the facts on the Democrats and the Republicans, on the House and the Senate, and on the White House. Let's put some credibility into this investigation. Let's stand up and do the jobs that we were elected to do. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Turner of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you recognizing all of us to have an opportunity to speak on this very important issue. You know, I think the American people if observing this committee hearing would probably conclude that once again Washington is embroiled in partisanship and I think that perhaps they would be right those of us who are freshmen who came here with a commitment to try to be sure that this Congress operates on a bipartisan fashion and works in a nonpartisan way on particularly on issues of such importance to the American people as this investigation uh, we are disappointed. 
You know, I think that it's important for us to really recognize and to center in on what this debate today is all about, not partisanship, but it's about the powers of the Congress. And one of the most powerful and intrusive powers that the Congress has is the power to subpoena citizens of these United States. That is a power that any legislative body should exercise with great caution and great care. It's a power that, as has been mentioned here before, is frightening to the average citizen. A power that, more often than not, results in great expense to the one that is subpoenaed. We in the Congress have an obligation to protect the constitutional rights of every citizen and to be sure that the rights and duties that we hold as members of this body are exercised judiciously. When subpoenas are issued by a court of law, there are some protections for the citizen, some opportunities to object, and those subpoenas are issued by what we hope is an impartial judge. Like it or not, the Congress is not organized that way. The Congress of the United States is organized by party. And the party that is in control, I think, has an obligation to ensure that the power they exercise is not only fair, but is perceived to be fair by all who observe it. In this instance, we have asked for a simple declaration that any subpoenas issued by this committee be with the concurrence of the ranking member, Mr. Waxman, or if disagreement exists between the chair and the ranking member, that this committee be given the opportunity to vote on the matter. You may, Mr. Chairman, say this is a matter of power of a chair, but we all know there are 24 Republicans and 20 uh, Democrats, or 19 Democrats and one independent on this committee. Any vote that would come down along partisan lines clearly would be decided in favor of the chair. We think it would be very little to ask to preserve the confidence of the American people in the process that we're about to embark upon to ask the chair to support the amendment that's been offered by Mr. Barrett. I've served in the legislature of Texas for 10 years and never in my tenure of service have I seen a legislative body with such powers placed in the chair, Democrat or Republican. This is an important investigation and Democrats as well as Republicans have an obligation to get the, to the bottom of these issues. From our vantage point, we started off on somewhat of a difficult footing because of the limited scope of the investigation. I frankly think the American people would like to see Democrat and Republican campaign fundraising abuses investigated by this committee, as is taking place in the Senate. But be that as it may, I think we must proceed in a fair manner, a manner that has the credibility of the committee and will hold the credibility of the American people through what will, I'm sure, be somewhat a somewhat lengthy process. Mr. Chairman, I would urge you to reconsider your position in light of the fact that many of us on this committee feel that our committee service has been adversely affected by the very opening meeting which we have, have, an, have had an opportunity to participate in today, a process that we know needs to be open, needs to be fair, and that we all believe in very strongly. And I hope that this committee will understand that those of us on this side of the committee room are not doing this for partisan posturing, but we're doing it because we believe in the importance of the credibility of the work product of this committee that will result from the work that we do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Allen of Maine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you and all the members on the other side for allowing the debate to come down this far. I'm acutely conscious that I sit at the end of the, of the row here. I am a freshman, but like all of those on this committee, there are approximately 600,000 people who live in the first district in my district, which happens to be the first district of Maine. And I believe I have a pretty good sense of what they expect from all of us. They expect a full, complete, thorough investigation and one that is also fair, fair to all concerned. And that's the challenge, because one of the things I've learned in my first few months here in Washington 
is that this is a partisan organization, and there is nothing more difficult than to put aside partisanship when it comes to ethics, matters of ethics, or matters that involve an investigation of this kind, of this sensitivity. But I know this. I know that this is the Government Reform and Oversight Committee. It isn't just an oversight committee. And I believe firmly that what we do here in this committee process has to lay the foundation for legislative action on the reform of campaign finance practices. And that is why we have to pay attention to fundamental fairness as we go through this exercise. No judge in the country, no elected official in the country has the powers that the chairman seeks in this instance. That is the power to issue any subpoena and the power to release any information that comes back in response to that subpoena. To take just one example, over centuries in Europe and in the United States, we have developed an attorney-client privilege that, work, that balances the interests in protecting attorney-client uh, communications and still allows people to get at the truth. The attorney-client privilege could be violated simply by the release of documents by the chairman unilaterally as a result of the protocol that is laid before us today. That is why one reason I object to it. But I also want to take a moment to go back and look at the subpoenas that have already been issued, the 101 subpoenas that have already been issued, and explain why it's important to have some input from the other side to make sure those are narrowly restricted. Number one. Chairman Burton subpoenaed all phone records from Air Force One and Air Force Two, and that requires the disclosure of calls that the President and his national security team made to heads of state regarding foreign policy negotiations. Two, Chairman Burton subpoenaed all records relating to all official delegation trips abroad. That clearly encompasses policy recommendations and decisions relating to these trips that involve national security. Three, the American Institute in Taiwan's records were also subpoenaed. And the release of those records could have uh, far-reaching ramifications. Another subpoena requested the release of all records of visitors to the White House and to Camp David for the last four years. This subpoena in invades the, le the legitimate privacy interests of, of the first family, I mean, because it involves the records of doctors, clergy, relatives, and friends of Chelsea Clinton. And coming back to the sensitivity of this kind of subpoena, the, the uh, subpoena to the Democratic National Committee, 11 pages long, uh, numerous requests. One of them says, all records relating to any meetings held in the White House attended by the DNC, including, but not limited to, all meetings generally known as the Wednesday morning meetings. That covers all documents by the DNC involved in meetings in the White House. It isn't limited even to fundraising documents, all documents, political strategy documents. It is far too overbroad, and it creates the impression that one party is simply rummaging around in the files of the other party for partisan advantage. That is the kind of action that we need to stop before those subpoenas go out the door. And finally, I would like to say this. When you look at the issue, now that it has been thoroughly debated. What is really at stake here today is language, an amendment to the rule. Uh, I hear the chairman and I hear the uh, distinguished gentleman from California, the vice chair, saying, we intend in practice to consult with the other side. And my question is, why not then put it in writing? Why not then lay down, accept the amendment that, that, is, that the Democrats are offering today? Let's make sure that this chairman and this committee, that the chairman of this committee acts as the representative of the entire committee, and that we do not have a case of an aggregation of power that is unique in American political history and unique to this committee. That is not the most effective way that we should begin these most important and most difficult investigations. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentleman from Maine. If no one else seeks recognition, the vote is now on the amendment of the gentleman from Wisconsin. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. 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 In the opinion, Chair, the noes have it. The noes have Mr. it. Mr. Chairman, can Chairman ask for a record vote. No? I'm sorry. I withdraw, withdraw that.
In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is defeated. The gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the purpose of offering an amendment? Well, if, if, prior to offering my amendment, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like oh. to get a clarification of the protocol document before us. The protocol document uh, says this uh, is going to apply to an investigation. Okay. Uh, let me offer my amendment first. I have an amendment. The gentleman recognized for an amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. In the appropriate place, insert the following. The ranking minority member may submit proposed subpoenas to the chair. The chair shall inform the ranking minority member within three calendar days whether the chair will issue the suggested subpoenas. If the chair, one, informs the ranking member that the chair will not issue the I ask the unanimous consent the amendment be considered Without read. objection, the amendment is considered as read. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to address my remarks to my Republican colleagues who wanted a scope of this investigation that is not just focused on the White House. And I think that we are uh, looking at a scope that's broader in this investigation. We have lost so far in this committee the ability, after the chairman makes a unilateral decision that he wants to go ahead with a subpoena, to ask the committee to consider if we disagreed with that subpoena, whether it ought to be issued. We will not be able to second guess any of his subpoenas. This amendment, however, deals with the time when we want a, sub a subpoena from the minority side. And if we want to issue a subpoena from the minority side, we will go to the chairman and let him know we're interested in that subpoena. The amendment before you would set out a procedure that if, um, if um, he does not agree with this subpoena or re does not respond to our request for a subpoena, we at least have an appeal to the committee. All of what we're talking about is the ability for the committee to function, not just for the chairman to be the final decider of an issue. So the amendment before us would uh, set forth that if the chairman will not support an amendment that the minority wishes to offer, that if a majority of the minority members sign a petition, we will then have the opportunity to make our case to all of the members. Understand, if you let the chairman decide all these questions unilaterally, we can't even argue our case to the Republican majority. We don't have enough to vote out any subpoena in this committee unless we can win over some of the Republicans. But we can't even win them over unless we can get their attention and make our case why we think a subpoena is appropriate. So this amendment would give us a way to do that. Now, some people have said to me in private, well, why don't you have more signatures? Why don't you have a majority of the committee sign some petition. We already have that ability in the rules now to force a meeting with the majority. That's like a discharge petition. We shouldn't have to meet that kind of a barrier simply to make our arguments to our colleagues to give us the right to pursue this full investigation with the expanded scope on some of the issues that we want explored. For example, if the chairman wanted this investigation to be partisan, he could approve subpoenas on his own that are directed to Republicans, to uh, Democrats. If we wanted you know, the Republican National Committee, he could say no. Now, if we wanted to ask for some specific information from the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee or Republican National Committee or some of the people that have given money to the Republican Party or some of the groups that are involved in soft money abuses, we we could request of him to issue that subpoena. But if he wants to be partisan, he could say no. And then our hope is we can at least appeal to the Republican members of the committee, assuming the Democrats are united, to join with us in giving us a majority to go ahead with the subpoena anyway. So that, that is uh, what we're asking for in this amendment. I think it's straightforward, and it will at least give us a chance to make our case to the final arbiter of the decision-making, which ought to be the committee itself. I would urge uh, support for it. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I appeal to my Republican colleagues 
to give uh, those of us in the minority the chance to at least make our case to them. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hasper. I thank the chairman, and I just want to say and extend to uh, the ranking minority uh, member from Florida, the gentleman or from California, excuse me, uh, who we've served together on many committees for a long, long time. I have the highest respect for his work and certainly uh, his view uh, of trying to be fair and to, to move forward. However, one of the things that uh, we've tried to do, and I think that's the scope and the focus in this committee, is try to look at those questions that traditionally have been in the scope of this committee. Uh, the protection of our borders, the protection of uh, issues of national security, the issues of uh, how we deal with uh, government agencies, U.S. government agencies. And of course that's where the focus has gone. Uh, traditionally for the 200 years this uh, committee has uh, worked and functioned. And uh, I think that uh, one of the things that we need to be able to do is to move forward with that issue. Uh, there are a lot of issues out there. Uh, there's been allegations of hush money. There's uh, been allegations that foreign policy uh, issues need to be looked at. There's allegations that uh, foreign governments have attempted to funnel millions of dollars into presidential campaigns. Uh, there's been allegations that uh, Chinese gun mer merchants are involved and what we need to do is to get to the bottom of these issues, to be able to issue um, those subpoenas that are necessary, and certainly not to limit the ability for the minority to come forward and discuss uh, their ability to move subpoenas forward in that discussion with the, with the chairman of this committee. I think, <clears throat> as the chairman has pledged, to work on a bipartisan basis, uh, hopefully that this whole committee can continue to work on a bipartisan basis, uh, that we'll be able to do so. And uh, if the ranking minority member comes forward, has his agenda, has his ability to uh, bring forward uh, uh, subpoenas that he think, thinks are within the scope of what uh, this committee is going to do, uh, I think his comments certainly would be uh, welcomed, that they would be listened to, and uh, within that dis decision of the chairman would be acted upon. So I understand why uh, the gentleman from California certainly would like to have a greater expansion of his ability to uh, take his committees, his uh, subpoenas or proposals for subpoenas before this committee. Uh, that's certainly understandable. But the fact is that we, it's the chairman's job to keep this committee within the scope to listen to the request of the minority, to act upon the request of the minority, and I'm sure he will. And uh, I think that this uh, amendment ought to be rejected. And I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman uh, who seeks time. Gentleman from uh, Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, having the, my colleague who just spoke uh, talk about the scope of the campaign gives me further reason to raise some questions here. The indication seemed to be that there was no need for this amendment because uh, the scope of the investigation is going to be limited, and that sort of concerns me. I'm wondering if the chairman will tell us whether, whether or not he perceives or he's going to determine within his uh, language on the protocol that there will be an investigation of political fundraising improprieties and possible violations of law by persons or entities within the, gov the committee's oversight jurisdiction. Does that language include a review of the Republican National Committee as well as the Democratic National Committee. I want to read to you very clearly so that there's no misunderstanding. That would be great. The focus of this investigation will center on well-publicized allegations of possible attempts to corrupt the American political process or compromise national security. Our investigative efforts will seek to determine whether and to what extent illegal actions or foreign money influence government officials or official government policies and actions. Substantial evidence of improprieties will be pursued wherever it leads, wherever it leads. Naturally, 
There will be priorities in our investigation. Uh. This committee is charged by the House with the primary oversight of the executive branch operations and that tradition will continue. However, that does not that does not preclude the committee from investigating substantial evidence of improprieties within, the, within its jurisdiction. We are not going to prejudge where the facts will lead us. Beyond that, I won't go other than to say exactly what was in that statement. We're not going to limit it. Well, I thank you for answering, Mr. Chairman. I can tell you I'm very uncomfortable with that language, and uh, particularly given the history uh, that I've seen in this thing and every statement that's been made and reported uh, anywhere in this thing. And, and I would feel much more comfortable and hope that my colleague who just spoke uh, will accept the language of the ma minority members concerning uh, the ability of the minority to have subpoenas, because I think we don't need to have unilateral prioritization on the heels of unilateral issuance of subpoenas and unilateral release of documents uh, and somebody deciding what the priorities are going to be and having them stop at a, at a different place, I'd like a clarification that the priorities are going to be that each of the parties is going to be investigated, that the Senate, both sides be investigated, the House candidacies and the White House, both parties. And let's get it on the table, Mr. Chairman. Let's not keep referring back just to the language. Will you answer me very directly, sir? Are you going to do that or are you going to set your priorities, target it where you want to target it, as has been reported, and leave us all out there uh, worrying about what's going to happen. We, I'm not going to prejudge today where the facts are going to take us. Are you going to answer I, me, though, Mr. Chairman? I, I, I am answering you. Well, directly, though. I am answering you, gentlemen from Massachusetts. I'm not going to prejudge anything today. I'm telling you that we are going to look at illegal activities involving foreign contributions wherever it takes us. Wherever it takes us. Gentlemen, yield to me. I'll certainly yield. Look, this is the first time we've heard the investigation of this committee being defined as uh, one on foreign contributions. But I want to point out that all the people that were involved in the coffees at the White House were subpoenaed. And the uh, head of the, the currency, uh, Mr. Ludwig, he had a subpoena. Craig Livingston had a subpoena. There's no information that any of these people had anything to do with foreign contributions. Second point I want to make is this. The chairman said, there's going to be some prioritization. That means we go to him with a request to look at the Republican National Committee and the perhaps attempt by foreign governments to influence the Republican campaigns for Congress and the Democratic campaigns for Congress. He can then tell us, well, that's really not what we're looking at. We've got to set our priorities, and therefore we're not going to let you have a subpoena. What recourse do we have? after that. We at least ought to have the ability to come to the committee and make our case. And I don't understand why the chairman would be afraid of the Republican members deciding this matter, because if he has all the Republicans backing him, he'll prevail. All we ask is for a chance to make a, an attempt to see if we can influence Mr. Cox or Mr. La Tourette Mr. Shays or Ms. Morella, to see if they think we're making a good uh, a proposal for an inquiry that is appropriate in looking at campaign finance illegalities and abuse. That's all we want is our chance to make the case. And what we have so far is the uh, vesting in the chairman the power to keep the members from making the decision because he alone will make it. I thank the gentleman. Thank you. I reclaim my time. The gentleman uh, from California, Mr. Cox, spoke earlier about a partnership agreement, and, and I just want to say that I don't think that any attorney that he knows or I know would, uh, would advise people not to have a written agreement that clearly set down the understanding of the parties had they the choice to make. Uh, and I think this is a, a prime example of why we do things like that, so that there can't be any later uh, disagreement over what the intention was. And I've heard time and time again today how it's the intention of the party, to, the majority, to do this or do that, and we have to have faith in it. Um, but then we saw a gag rule order pass of the first thing today. Now we've heard that there's going to be priorities uh, determined unilaterally by the chair. Uh, I think that we ought to talk about having things written down in this protocol so that we all know where we stand. I think this amendment ought to be accepted, and then I think we ought to move on and clarify what those priorities are. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, yields back the balance of the time. Chairman. I want to, uh, before I yield to the next uh, member, uh, state very clearly uh, what 
obviously was misunderstood a moment ago. Our investigative efforts will seek to determine whether and to what extent illegal actions or foreign money, illegal actions or foreign money, influence government officials or official government policies and actions. That was part of my statement, and uh, it was not uh, not coming. Mr. Micah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, having been in the minority. Uh, I am very sensitive to the rights of the minority and want to make certain that they have the tools. Uh, uh, fought for and spoke for giving you uh, more investigative uh, staff, uh, which you have, than we had. Uh, the, the freshman members that are down at the end, I'll realize it, but when I sat at that end uh, and we had investigations and the, your side controlled the, the House by an overwhelming majority, the Senate and the White House, the ratio of investigators on this committee were five Republican staff uh, investigators to 55. Uh, Would the so gentleman yield for a second? Uh, not at this point, but uh, if I have time, I'd be glad to. Uh, and as far as resources, too, even resources and funding, uh, we'll be spending a little bit more than half of what they spent on the equivalent uh, committee uh, activities, even with this investigation in place. Uh, so um, uh, those are just two points I want to make. Now, I want to speak specifically to the proposed amendment by the ranking minority member. And in fact, uh, the ranking, uh, the, uh, the amendment says the ranking minority member may submit proposed subpoenas to the chair. Well, that really exists to, today, and he may. And we would like for him to consult with us. If we look at the purpose of this hearing and the reason that this protocol is here today is that there had not been a, a, a protocol previously in place. And you see how the other side operated and I documented it, that he, uh, hearings went on and on without uh, uh, protocols uh, in place. So we're not trying to thwart that. We, we think that uh, he should have that right, the ranking minority member should have the right uh, to offer subpoenas. We're asking for no more power for a, a chairman. What you heard is Ms. Norton, who's gone, talked about not just the power, but the practice. The practice and the only experience we have is to date, we have issued 101 subpoenas. One to the Democratic National Committee, two to the White House, one to Mr. Livingstone. All the rest relate to the five uh, individuals who have either refused to produce documents uh, uh, or have fled the country. Uh, we, have the asked, yield? we have asked the consultation of the minority on these, and you heard the ranking member also say he refused 100. We are almost through 20 percent of this Congress by practical uh, numbers. And where would we be if, if all of these subpoenas were uh, blocked? So we are trying to thwart this. People on this side, Mr. Shays and others, Mrs. Borella, we uh, intervened with the chairman to make sure that you're, you would get a fair hearing on your protocol. And we've had weeks and weeks to discuss this. And we've tried to be fair. And we want to be fair. We want to make certain that this procedure follows. So this actually stymies uh, your rights, in my opinion. Uh, and and uh, I think that you have those rights already to go to the chairman go to the others, and a majority of this committee can get any subpoena Gen that they yield. would like. Gentlemen, yield to me. I'll back the balance of my time. Gen Gen gentlemen, yield to me. I'm not going to yield to me then. Time. Mr. Fatah. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> will the gentleman yield to me for a minute? I'd be glad to yield the, to the him. The gentleman from Florida who told me he respects minority rights didn't have the courtesy to yield to me because I, I would want to clarify to him that he's, I don't think this is limiting our, our power to, co to consult. What, what we're trying to do is not just be able to come in and talk to the chairman, but I want to talk to you. Yeah. I want to talk to you and I want to talk to Mr. Shays, Mr. Morella, and Mr. Cox, and everybody else if I think the chairman is wrong. And we don't have the ability to do that. We don't have the ability to get a meeting of the committee to argue why we think one of our proposed subpoenas ought to go forward. So I, I don't think that we're being limiting ourselves, and I thank you for looking out for our interests, by leaving the protocol as it is, because the protocol as it is says, I can talk to the chairman, I can make my case to him, and he can say no. Now that to me is not claiming, full participation. Well, Thank you. claiming my time. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me see if I could uh, help move the discussion along. 
And I know that there's probably concern about why the Democrats are so concerned about all these rules. But I think if we would look at the facts as they are, which is that the chairman, uh, for all of the respect that we may have for him, has made it rather plain in his public pronouncements over the last four years that he doesn't think the President of the United States is the most uh, honorable person in the world. Uh, one of the members of the, uh, on the other side who was just telling us how fair the rules are has already said that he thinks the President should be impeached. Uh, so he has no need for an investigation. He's already made a conclusion. And that what we have is a, a hundred and some subpoenas that have went out, none of which uh, have focused on not just issues that we think are important, but even Republicans in the U.S. Senate have issued these subpoenas on issues that uh, reasonable people could agree should be a part of this investigation. So what we have here is an investigation that is uh, at, at best one-sided. Um, and I think that we talked about the fact that it won't have credibility. We've asked for a reasonable concurrence with the issuance of subpoenas. We've heard about the practices and precedents of the House as relates to the Lantos and Shays investigation on HUD in which there was concurrence on every subpoena, but that was voted down. Now we're at the point of looking for just the opportunity to raise the issue of subpoenas to the majority of the members of the committee so that they can vote on it. And what we've heard thus far is that, oh no, you don't understand how fair we really want to be to you. And so I just think that the, the record should be clear that as this committee launches this investigation, nothing that is being done by the majority is moving us towards some sense of balance and fairness. Notwithstanding the words that have been uttered today from the other side, of telling us uh, from Representative Cox and others how fair you want to be, that in fact, in terms of what you are actually doing, in terms of the, the, the rules and the protocol that's being set in place, is that you are uh, shoving this investigation forward. And I believe that you are going to regret this uh, to no end. Because what the public has to see now is they see the US Senate moving in a balanced way. And they see the House acting in a totally contrary way in terms of this investigation. So it's not just the Democrats who are uh, crying foul. They will have an example to point to. And I want to thank the chairman for yielding me this I'd just like to say to my colleague, Mr. Fatah, you notice the green light is still burning brightly there. That's why I thank the chairman at the See, conclusion we, of my remarks. I wanted to make absolutely sure that you realize we didn't short you. You've been more than fair. Mr. Thank Lant you. Chairman. Mr. Lantos. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back uh, in discussing this uh, amendment to the lantos Shays investigation. Uh, which uh, was viewed by both political parties as a, as a model of a bipartisan investigation. We have spent a great deal of time today on rules and procedures, which is fine. But I think the reason we are spending so much time on rules and procedures is because there is no trust on this side in the willingness of the Republicans to conduct a fair and bipartisan investigation. That is the underlying issue. Now, when you um, hear, as I did earlier from Mr. Micah, that the ranking minority member may submit proposed subpoenas to the chair, what I hear Mr. Micah saying is that the right of free speech still prevails. We don't question that he may not have the right to submit anything he wants to. We need a procedure which gives us the guarantee minimally of a committee vote. We are not second-class citizens in this body. You have a very narrow majority in the House of Representatives, but you have structured the operation of this committee as if it were a one-party state. Now, I'm one of the few members of this body who had the distinct displeasure of living under one-party governments. And they make me sick. And the reason we are fighting these rules and procedures, because these are rules and procedures designed to 
render the democratic side of this aisle wholly impotent. We can make a request, and if Mr. Burton in his judgment says no, that's the end of it. That's not the way a democratic body should function. We should minimally have the right to bring the issue to a vote in a body in which you have the majority. Everybody who is listening to this across this country understands what elemental fairness is. We are not asking that people we want to subpoena automatically be issued a subpoena. That's not what we are asking. We are asking that if the chairman and the ranking member do not agree, we should have the privilege of bringing this issue before this body, which has a Republican majority. So you can vote us down every single time. What you have done so far today, and you have got the votes, and you can play this game ad nauseum, ad infinitum. Nobody likes it, I can tell you, outside of this little room. What we are asking is fair procedures. We are not getting them. What we are asking is that the ranking minority member should have the privilege of bringing a subpoena proposal to the chair. If they agree, no problem. If they don't agree, we would like a vote. What is undemocratic about it? Why are you digging in your heels? Why are you afraid to vote on these issues. You are denying us the privilege as a legislative body to engage in the counting of heads, which is the way democratic legislative bodies operate. We have been accustomed during uh, uh, the last two years of losing most issues. We understand that will happen here too, but I am, I am intrigued and I'm asking the chair to to answer me directly, if I may get his attention. What specifically, Chairman Burton, diminishes your authority as chairman if we adopt the proposal of the ranking minority member? You are not forced to issue a subpoena that he is proposing. You can say no to him. All he has then is the right to bring this issue to the body. What is wrong with that, Mr. Chairman? Does any other committee have that? Mr. Lantos, uh, we have been here for, I don't know, two or three hours now, and I've been questioned time and time again about the protocol. The protocol speaks for itself. I think everybody here is aware. I'm not asking you about the protocol. I understand, protocol. but I am not here to be grilled. I'm here to conduct the hearing, and I'm doing that. And I'm not going to answer any more of these questions. I would like to have us proceed in an orderly fashion. You're welcome to say anything you want to say, Mr. Lantos, as is any other member of the committee. But I'm not going to continue to answer questions that everybody keeps pulling out of the air. So with that, I'll just tell you, Mr. Lantos, uh, proceed with your five minutes. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, in the spirit of Hershey, Pennsylvania, I really don't think it's too much to ask a chairman why he is opposing an amendment. I mean, this is not an extraneous issue. I'm not asking personal questions of your life. I am asking a committee proposal. And I, while you can deny my, my right, I believe, to expect an answer of you, this doesn't speak well of you. This shows a, an authoritarian, dictatorial, undemocratic approach to the procedure of the committee. I am asking a rational question. What is wrong with this proposal? And you are not choosing to answer. Your response is that you are not responding. Is that what it is? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Lane. I'll Mr. be Chairman. happy to yield. Well, that, that speaks to the point. If the Chairman tells me, when I ask for a subpoena to further this investigation, that I don't want to talk about it, then what do I do? I can't then make an argument to Mr. Davis and Ms. Morell and Mr. Shays that perhaps the Chairman's incorrect because we'll never have an opportunity for the committee to The meet. gentleman from California's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Chairman? Mr. Davis from Virginia? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, let me just say that, uh, Mr. Waxman, you can talk to me anytime. You don't need to do it at a hearing room. In fact, many times we're going to get business done in a better fashion if we can sit. And, and I, all you need are three Republican members. 
to join with you to issue a subpoena on anybody if the chairman doesn't want it and join with the United Democratic Front. And that subpoena can be issued uh, at a special meeting called for exactly that. I don't know of any other committees that has the authority that you're asking for written in the rules, and maybe that's why the chairman objects to it. I'll let him speak to that. But we do have a mechanism. I think there are reasonable members on both sides that if a subpoena is appropriate, that we can then force a vote if we think the chairman is being a, a strong arm. And so I would reply to you, you still have that opportunity to make that argument to us. You may not be able to force a vote in every case and, and, and tie things up if you don't have the votes, but you would have the opportunity to make your presentation to individuals over here. And I think in some cases you may be successful if the chairman is being obstinate. Will you yield to I would me? be happy. I appreciate what you're saying, but this is the difficulty I have with it. You are a reasonable person and I can talk to you and I could go to different individual Republicans and make my case and maybe uh, win you over. But we're all very busy people and it's hard to get people to focus on an issue. I want to be able to make it in a public forum. You ought to be held accountable. People, all of us ought to be held accountable. And if I, don't, if, I, if I can't, look, I'm making arguments today and it looks like I'm not prevailing. So the Republicans can certainly outvote me. But you said that I can get a majority. But I can't get a majority to call a meeting right. because we'd have to then have a discharge petition. Why have an extraordinary, why have to go through an extraordinary procedure even to get a, a, an opportunity to make the case to well, members well, who, are gonna, who should vote on these? Well, matters. I think, first of all, the House rules allow for exactly what you're asking. And it's uh, is you, uh, 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 with a majority, you'd have to bring people in ahead of time and have your votes ahead instead of making it a forum. But I think that saves a lot of time sometimes if you have the votes and move forward than coming here and spending the day trying to put things up in, in motions that may be off the subject of what the chairman and a majority of the committee want to do. And uh, I don't know other committees that offer the same kind of, uh, of, of authority that you're asking for. Maybe you could tell us, and I'm going to yield to the gentleman. Well, uh, you know, if you're talking about unprecedented things that have not been done in other committees, we're giving the chairman the sole decision well, to just, issue So you subpoenas. don't have any precedent for this either in other committees? Pardon? We don't have any precedent for the, a chairman having I, a sole me, decision me, maker. I only have a few minutes, so let me yield to my uh, other friend from California, Mr. Collins. You want... Oh, I thank you. I, perhaps I should just get time on my own since I take it your time's about to expire. But if you want to be lenient, I'll, uh, I'll take just a moment. Because uh, both my colleagues from California uh, are raising points that I'd like to uh, address. Uh, it seems to me that this question about uh, the minority issuing subpoenas uh, is of a piece uh, with the other question, which is the scope of the subpoenas that uh, the full committee sends out. Uh, and it goes directly to the core of the integrity of the investigation and the reason for it. Uh, what we are investigating chiefly, as this committee always has done, uh, is in fact uh, abuse of agencies and departments of the executive branch. Uh, as my colleagues know, uh, there isn't any instance in over 200 years of this committee exercising its jurisdiction otherwise. Uh, that is, uh, in fact, as well, uh, what uh, all the newspaper stories are about. Uh, in specific, uh, the ranking member mentioned that uh, he personally supports the appointment of an independent counsel in this case. And the reason that we have an independent counsel statute and the reason that an independent counsel is an appropriate uh, uh, choice for the Attorney General to make here is that there is an inherent conflict of interest in the Clinton administration investigating itself, just as there would be a conflict of interest were this committee to investigate itself. Uh, that is not what we are charged with doing. That's not what we're setting about to do. Uh, but the Attorney General's conflict of interest is uh, a rather uh, significant one. Uh, she, as Attorney General, is in charge of the FBI. And yet, can she investigate the FBI? Uh, she, as Attorney General, is directly appointed by and reports to the President. Can she investigate the President? Uh, she has said, notwithstanding all of the evidence that's fulsome in the public record, uh, that she hasn't seen anything uh, that requires the appointment of an independent counsel. And so we wonder whether or not uh, the fact uh, that the foreign contributions have been made to the Democratic National Committee, uh, that the foreign contributions have been made to the White House, uh, doesn't raise a conflict of interest. And we want to be sure that for political reasons, the investigation 
cannot be obstructed. And what we're talking about here uh, is a procedure that would require that we have a full committee hearing before the issuance of any subpoena if the majority elected to do that. That would put the, po the power in the hands of the majority, uh, excuse me, if the minority elected to do that. If the minority elected to have a hearing and to have a vote on every subpoena, that would be the import of the first the amendment gentleman yield. That's not this what this amendment, amendment says. This, as I said, talking about these two amendments together, no, no, that is this exactly amendment what before us does not state that, though. This one says that you could force a hearing on any subpoena that you propose. No, but... but the, correct. The that is, that is correct. It's my time. Uh, okay. I say to my friend, that is correct. This forces a vote on... It forces a vote. It doesn't force a, uh, a subpoena, obviously, without a majority vote. But it, uh, does, uh, of the it does force a vote, and if correct. you read this amendment carefully, there is no limitation on the number of subpoenas that's correct. That may be put forward. Therefore, there is no limitation on the number of hearings, uh, the number of hours that 44 members of this full committee could be required to deliberate, the number of votes that would have to be scheduled, and therefore the chairman could lose entire control of the whole committee, something that when I was in the minority I would have loved to be able to pull off, but I don't think it's a wise thing for us to do in this investigation if we're serious about it going forward rather than obstructing it. Thank you. Let me just, uh, in my remaining seconds, say I'm amused. On the one hand, in the last couple of amendments, we were arguing there was no precedent. That we hadn't adopted uh, protocols. There was precedent for the chairman issuing subpoenas without getting the concurrence of the uh, minority, and I think the chairman Klinger did that on four occasions. Here, there doesn't appear to be precedent. So it's, on the one hand, you argue precedent. There is no precedent here. This is politics. This is what this is about, it, it seems to me, Mr. and Davis. not whether there's been precedent or not. I yield Will the back. gentleman yield uh, to me to save some time? Uh, without objection, the gentleman be given 30 additional seconds. Sure. Without objection. I, I, I just want to say, because we can debate this at length and maybe members will want to, and I'll never cut off a member's ability to speak, but this to me is the bare minimum of what the minority ought to have, at least the ability to make the case. And, I, and, and that's our argument, and if, we're, if, if the majority is ready to vote that down uh, and but, deny us that, let's go to the vote. And but can I just ask on. my colleague, what other committees does the minority have the ability to bring this forward? Every committee requires the chairman to get a vote of the committee if the ranking minority does not agree to subpoenas, and but that is a protection that allows the committee to act. I think we've already given the chairman this unilateral power and I don't think you ought to have it so to the point where we can't even make our case. That's a different issue. Side. There's no precedent. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Shall we go to the vote now? Or, uh, oh, Mr. Sanders of Vermont. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, a while back, actually quite a while back, uh, Mr. Cox, I thought, made a very cogent statement. And he said, as I understood it, that for the process to be successful, there has to be a bipartisan or nonpartisan approach. And he used Watergate. I think, as, as a good example, where the Republicans then in the minority worked with uh, the majority. And I agree with basically what, what you said, Mr. Cox. The problem that you have here today is that it is not good enough for anybody to talk, T-A-L-K, to talk about bipartisanship or a nonpartisan approach when clearly the key votes are going to be decided along a party line, and we already had one vote, which was done, which was won by two votes with the majority over the minority. That is not bipartisanship. What bipartisanship is, is when the minority leader, in this case Mr. Waxman, stands up with the chairman and said, we have worked out an agreement, and we are going forward together. It's not talking about it. It is, in fact, winning the support working out the agreements, making the compromises to go forward together. So we could have all of the lip service that we want about nonpartisanship, but if the votes keep coming out majority over minority by a few votes, by definition, that is partisanship, and that's what it is. A few moments ago, no, not a few moments ago, a while back, Mr. Scarsborough uh, talked about, I think I'm quoting him correctly, when he said, uh, some people on this side want to change the subject, not clean up the system. But let me tell you, I want to clean up the system. I think the system that we have right now in terms of campaign financing is atrocious. I think what's going on in the White House is very bad. I think it is very bad when multimillionaires contribute hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. I think it is very bad when people who are billionaires can take out their checkbook and run for office just because they're rich. 
And I think it's a sad state of affairs when over half the American people have given up on the political process. They don't even vote because they think big money dominates the entire political process. I want to clean up the system. I would suspect there are people on your side who want to clean up the system. People on this side want to clean up the system. And when I asked Mr. Cox and other members on both sides, do you really think the American people are going to believe that this process is sincere about wanting to clean up the system when you're going to have votes by which the majority defeats the minority by two votes or three votes and every single vote comes down on a partisan basis? Does anyone seriously believe that we're going to be quote unquote cleaning up the system when we do not ask the same hard questions of the Republican Party as we do of the Democratic Party as we do of the White House? I think an honest answer is most Americans will see this as a partisan effort, not as an honest effort of all sides working together to clean up uh, the system. So I would, would simply hope that there are enough people on both sides of the aisle who do want to go forward in a nonpartisan way. And to do that, let's just not talk about it. Let's do it. And uh, with that, I would be happy to yield Gentlemen, to uh, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand that the uh, chair uh, will not yield any questions about his conduct to this committee. And uh, because I respect the chair, and I do respect the chair, I, I will uh, respect that decision, even though I disagree with it. Um, and will I, the gentleman yield real briefly? Sure. Let, let me just say, I had answered, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 questions through the course of the day. I'm actually getting hoarse, and I really think that I've answered uh, enough questions. It's not that I don't want to answer questions. I'm just, I think we ought to get on with it. Oh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I can appreciate uh, that we have been here a long time, and the chair uh, <laughs> I'm certainly has uh, every right to... Uh, recognize the physical limitations that we all have, especially when the chair has had to speak so much. Uh, if, if you did yield to a question at this time uh, in this hearing, what I would ask, uh, even though I know you can't answer right now, I would ask uh, why Democrats are being targeted here and not Republicans, why the Democratic National Committee and not the Republican National Committee, uh, why the President of the United States and the First Family and not the Congress, uh, it is uh, clear we have an incomplete investigation ahead of us. Uh, Watergate was an abuse of power by the executive branch, and, and it drew its name from the place where the break-in originated. Uh, an abuse of power by the legislative branch may, in the years to come, be uh, uh, known as investigate. So I'm, uh, I, I regret that uh, the scope of this investigation uh, seems to be insufficient to be able to solve or rec make recommendations to the American people about the dilemma we're in with respect to campaign uh, finance abuse. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. Yeah, gentleman from... Uh, yeah, from um, I believe, uh, Mr. Lantos, did you want uh, some time? Did you want? I would yield to Mr. Lantos. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I know we are moving towards a vote. I'd like to make a couple of observations, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this protracted debate is a symptom. It is a symptom of the lack of confidence that this side has in the fairness with which this investigation will be conducted. I would think that you would be the first one to try to dispel that lack of confidence by showing a modicum of fairness as these very modest and rational and reasonable proposals are offered. We understand that we can be defeated in the vote, but it is difficult to reconcile protestations of fairness with the actions on the majority side. We, we simply can't hear what you are saying because what you are doing keeps thundering in our ears. That's why we can't, can't put any credence into claims of fairness and bipartisanship. Every single action here, beginning with the gag rule, indicates a lack of fairness. Now, uh, it, is a, it is regrettable that our first hearing on this very important matter 
has been a debate about our attempt to obtain minimum procedures of fairness being shut down, not even answered, uh, every step of the way. Um, it does not augur well, I believe, for this investigation, and I am convinced that it speaks very poorly for the credibility of the findings. I thank the Chair. Does the gentleman yield back the balance of his time? The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. If no one else seeks recognition, the vote is now... The unanimous consent request? Oh, the ge uh, yes, the gentleman is recognized for a unanimous consent request. Thank you, Mr. Chen. I want to put a couple of articles into the record, and I seek unanimous consent to do so. Uh, one is in relationship to um, a Hill story relative to Speaker Gingrich receiving illegal contributions from a South African <coughs> uh, firearms uh, manufacturer. The other is the uh, story that I referred to earlier uh, in today's New York Times about uh, subpoenas being issued by the United States Senate to a number of Republican groups, including the National Policy Forum, which was founded by Haley Barber and received donations and loans from the Republican National Committee. And the uh, last one is one from the Wall Street Journal, which indicates a sophisticated uh, scheme uh, to have uh, contributors make contributions to Republican-oriented PAC and then have those contributions targeted back to United States Senate and House members. Uh, if I could have uh, unanimous consent, I'd like these entered into the record. Without objection, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Mr. Chairman, I also have a unanimous consent uh, request, and it deals with a protocol history which I've developed, and it documents a uh, uh, protocol under the uh, uh, protocol uh, under the uh, previous. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Congress, the 103rd Congress, and it shows the abusive uh, pattern that was established back then that we are avoiding today. So I ask unanimous consent that uh, this Without be made a part of the... If no one else seeks recognition, the, the vote is now on the amendment of the gentleman from California. Uh, the gentleman from California has just asked for... ...call call vote, so I'll dispense with the... Uh, uh, verbal vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes no. Mrs. Morella? Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes no. Ms. Ross Layton? Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Horn votes no. Mr. Micah? Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Davis of Virginia? No. Mr. Davis from Virginia votes no. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter, Mr. Scarborough, Mr. Shattuck, no. Mr. Shattuck votes no, Mr. LaTourette, Mr. LaTourette votes no, Mr. Sanford, Mr. Sanford votes no, Mr. Sununu, no. Mr. Sununu votes no, Mr. Sessions, no. Mr. Sessions votes no, <coughs> Mr. Pappas? No. Mr. Pappas votes no. Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Snowbarger votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Portman? No. Mr. Portman votes no. Mr. Waxman? Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Condent? Aye. Mr. Condent votes aye. Mr. Sanders? Aye. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? Mr. Fatah? 
Mr. Holden? Mr. Holden votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Bogoyevich votes aye. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Davis from Illinois votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. McHugh? Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mrs. Maloney? Ms. Norton? Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes aye. Mr. McIntosh, you're not recorded? You're not recorded, Mr. McIntosh? Mr. McIntosh votes no. Mr. Gilman, you're not record recorded? Mr. Gilman votes no. Mr. Chairman, there are 15 ayes and 21 nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Oh, uh, uh, the gentlelady from Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I wanted to offer a, uh, an amendment that I see as sort of a compromise. Uh, it strikes a balance between the need for the committee to respond in a timely fashion and need for member consultation. This is um, in, I think that the amendment has been distributed. This is in the uh, section that deals with uh, uh, non-classified documents uh, release. And it would pertain to that section uh, three. Uh, what it does basically is it establishes a working group with like a four to three ratio. And because of this working group, it will ensure that the majority and the minority members are going to have a chance to deliberate and render an opinion to the chair on the release of documents. And it will bring it, bring it about in an efficient, timely, and, uh, and very judicious manner. So I offer that amendment um, for discussion and for a favorable vote, I hope. Does, does the gentlelady yield back the balance for time? Yes, indeed. I, I gentlelady yield yields back the balance for time. The gentleman from California is recognized. I seek recognition to oppose the uh, amendment. I think it's a horrible precedent to uh, have a small group substitute for the rest of the members of the committee in making such an important de decision. It's really no protections at all. It's window dressing. It's still, this, this whole protocol still allows the chairman uh, to do something to know where the chairman no one else can do, and that's unilaterally issue subpoenas and, with the support of this rump group, make confidential information public. Uh, so I uh, think that we ought to have the members of this committee be able to make these decisions, not a smaller group, and uh, I uh, must rise in opposition to it. Yield back the balance of my thank time. You. Mr. Chairman, may I just I yield comment? to you. I have time. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, this, this is what Congress is all about. It's representative government. And when you have the, the chairman and the vice chairman and the ranking member and, uh, and, and other designees, two designees, they can deliberate. 
they can, they can um, consult with each other and they can consult with every member of the committee. It saves a great deal of time. It is being done by thoughtful people and then they make their uh, decision and uh, the decision is rendered. Um, I, I just think it has all of the elements of being able to work, uh, to work out in an efficient, efficient manner, which is a fair manner. Well, my problem is yeah, that I don't want my colleagues to delegate to me the authority to make a decision that's really theirs to make, and that's a disclosure of information that can single out a person as an FBI informant if it's inappropriate, or can uh, reveal attorney-client privileged information. I don't think a small group ought to make that. I don't think they ought to have that delegation. And it's in violation of the whole idea of open meetings and hearings where there's some accountability and some transparency. As I read your amendment, there wouldn't even have to be an open meeting. It would just be a smaller group, can meet somewhere in a back room, I hope not smoke-filled, but a back room nevertheless, and make a decision that it can adversely affect someone else's life because information will be disclosed. So with all due respect uh, for the gentlelady from Maryland, I think it's a, a, a dangerous precedent, uh, a, an amendment that I cannot support. I, I would urge its defeat. Yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. McIntosh. Uh, let me say very quickly, having gone through part of this investigation in our subcommittee on the White House computer database and having seen the responses come trickling in each time with the statement that there's nothing there and then fairly significant things being un unveiled as a result of that, I think it's critical that the committee be able to move quickly and effectively, as the chairman's indicated, he will use his discretion to do, to get that information out into the public. And so I would have to say I think it's very important that we not add an extra impediment or roadblock that could be used to try to delay public disclosure about what the facts are in this investigation. Uh, so I would, with all due respect to my colleagues on the other side, have to urge that we vote down this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. To support Mr. Morello's amendment. Excuse me. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McIntosh. <laughs> uh, who, Mr. Who Chairman. Seek, who seeks recognition? Uh, if no one else. Mr. Chairman. A uh, gentleman from California. I just wanted to uh, uh, thank my colleague from Maryland for offering this amendment and uh, suggest, as I did when we opened this morning, that uh, all the members, uh, and that includes the majority members as well as the minority members, uh, take full advantages of the procedures that this committee does adopt uh, so that we can involve ourselves because uh, the purpose of this amendment is in fact uh, to put a screen between the public and this committee when it comes to uh, release of information. And that screen consists in uh, seven members, three minority members, uh, and four majority members uh, who will meet and confer, who will consult on this. Uh, it's a useful procedure, a good procedure. Uh, there are, I can imagine, uh, many cases where we will want to deliberate on the release of documents, even though we're not talking about classified documents or secret documents. Uh, and uh, this is a very, very useful suggestion, uh, one that makes sure that we aren't dilatory, that we don't obstruct, uh, and yet at the same time that we do have uh, ample opportunity to meet and confer. Uh, and so uh, uh, while I understand from uh, the comments of the ranking member and from the conversations that we had prior to this that uh, uh, the ranking member would prefer to have a full committee hearing on every one of these things. Uh, I, I do hope that uh, we all take full advantage of this because uh, it does of necessity involve uh, both the minority and the majority uh, and it's an opportunity for us uh, to work uh, in good faith together and I, I want to congratulate my colleague from Maryland for offering it. Uh, and uh, look forward to working with the other side in carrying it out. Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, uh, yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Chairman, can I be heard? Uh, Mr. Briefly. Mr. Fatah. Thank you. I, I, I uh, rise in support of this amendment, even though I, I must agree with the ranking member that it does not represent the totality of uh, what I think would be appropriate, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And uh, notwithstanding all of the uh, smooth talk from the other side, I think that there is some interest in trying to find some way for us to work together. So I'm going to 
reach across the aisle for a second here and uh, join in support of this amendment and hope that uh, as we move some of our other amendments today, we might find a few votes on that side of the aisle. Thank you. If no other member seeks recognition, the vote is on the amendment of the gentlelady from Maryland. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. Chairman. Gentleman from California. I have, uh, we're at the very end of this process and I hope to avoid an amendment. I just want to ask some very specific questions and I'd like the attention of all those Republicans who wanted with us to have the scope of this investigation more uh, broad than uh, just the White House. Does the scope of this investigation definitively include activities of the Clinton campaign and White House? Chairman. The statement that uh, I read uh, very clearly into the record, I think two or three times, is very clear on the point of the broadness is the and answer the breadth yes. of the investigation. Is the answer yes or no? I will be happy to read to you this again. No, no, Mr. Chairman, why, why can't you respond to the question well, because, so we can have uh, because, very Mr. specific Waxman, information? Because, Mr. Waxman, I cannot tell you every single avenue we're going to pursue in this investigation. I cannot tell you how broad it is because every time we open one door, we find five more. And so I, can't, I don't want to be pinned down today on limiting or expanding the scope of the investigation because I think it would be improper for me in a quasi-judicial role to do that. Mr. Until, Chairman... If you I mean, like, we, I will read I, this I, again. No, and no, I'm going to reclaim my time. I'm trying to be collegial. Well, so I'm, am I. My time, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I'm trying to be collegial. I'm trying to avoid offering an amendment. It seems to me the scope that is written out in this protocol talks about anything within the uh, uh, com committee's oversight jurisdiction. And I would want to know if those words would include, if we thought it appropriate, to look at activities of the Clinton campaign and White House. And I assume that's the first thing you'd say yes to. Substantial evidence of improprieties will be pursued wherever they lead. At the White House? If Substanti they're there? Substantial evidence of improprieties will be pursued wherever they lead. The Democratic National Committee, yes or no? I have... I, why do you want me to keep reading this over and over? I've because just I, I don't clear. want you to. I want you to just give me a straight answer. I, I have given you a straight answer. Substantial evidence of... If it leads I, to I, the White House, isn't I, that what this is all about? Mr. Waxman, this is not a court of law. I'm not under oath, and I'm not on the bench right And you're now. not acting quasi-judicial. I am acting quasi-judicial. No, you're judicial. not. You're a chairman of a committee. You're not a judge, although you're being given a lot of powers to be one, but you're not a judge. You're only one of the members of this committee, and you're the lead on this. This is your protocol. Would your protocol, if you found improprieties at the White House, l be within the scope of this investigation? Mr. Waxman, if you want me to answer your question, I'll answer it one more time. It's not a trick. I just really Every, want a straight well, answer. Let me answer you, your question. We have found day in and day out as we get more evidence that there's a diff additional avenues that we have to pursue. Every time we open one door, we see four or five more. And so I go back to the statement I made, and I'm not going to limit or expand on it right now. Substantial evidence of improprieties if we and illegal it. activity will be pursued wherever they lead. Mr. Chairman, I try to avoid it. Let me offer an amendment. I have an amendment at the desk. Gentleman has an amendment. This is the amendment on scope. On page one in paragraph entitled Applicability Interpretation of Protocol on line three after jurisdiction, insert the following, which shall include an investigation of illegal and improper activities in connection with... I ask you the amendment be considered as read. Without objection. Uh, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, this amendment would simply have us adopt the, the language that the Senate has for the scope. And what I was trying to do, and I wasn't trying to trick the Chairman, was I, w I presume that th with the adoption of this language that the investigation could certainly look at abuses and possible illegalities at the White House by the Democratic National Committee, by the Republican National Committee, by donations of soft money, by the uh, uh, donations from nonprofit groups, uh, and it would certainly include as well congressional activities. I'm proposing that this committee adopt the same scope and have no equivocation, no ambiguity, that we're proceeding on the same wavelength 
as the investigation in the other body, which was adopted in the Senate 99 to 0. I urge, I urge and plead with my colleagues to adopt this amendment and let's go for the day, conclude our business, and uh, move on. Is there further discussion? Yes. Uh, who seeks recognition? Mr. Mr. Stah? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as promised, I knew there would be an opportunity for my colleagues on the other side to reciprocate. And here it is. Um, the, the, this, we come down to a fundamental issue of um, whether we're going to look at, you know, the entirety of the 1996 elections and improprieties and illegal activities that took place, or whether we're just going to focus on uh, the Democratic Party. Now, some might think that all of what we've been through here today is to insist that somehow the Democratic Party should be protected from any abuses that they may have uh, been involved in. That is not my intention, nor do I think it represents the intentions of the majority of the members on this side. I think what we are saying is that um, there is uh, issues that should be explored on both sides of the aisle, and that uh, there are activities that should be looked into. And if we're going to issue 100 subpoenas into Democratic activities, maybe there are 10 or 15 inquiries we like to make. If we don't broaden the scope, there won't be any opportunity ever for us to discuss subpoenaing anyone because the chairman will insist that it's not within the scope, it's not within the jurisdiction. The chairman keeps reading this nicely worded uh, uh, paragraph which explains the scope, except it doesn't explain the scope. What it does is it avoids laying out specifically what the scope of this investigation real, really will be. So we've given the chairman the power to subpoena, the power to release, and now the real issue is whether or not you're even going to have a scope that is broader than just the Democratic Party. Now, you know, you have the majority, you have the ability to, uh, to vote uh, this uh, up or down, and I'm sure you'll exercise that. Just because you have the might uh, does not always make it right. I would hope that you would uh, consider uh, expanding the scope as the United States Senate has done, as the newspapers today suggested across this country your chairman was going to do, uh, which was to broaden the scope. I hope that you would take this amendment, this opportunity, uh, and to uh, cast a vote into looking across the board fairly at the 1996 elections. Uh, Thank you. I, I have a statement I'd like to make here real quickly, and I'd first of all like to say, Mr. Fatah, I was expecting you to keep coming across on our side of the aisle. Well, you did once, but we'll have to wait for the next time, I guess. This amendment would arguably both broaden and narrow the committee's current investigative efforts. It would broaden the current focus by adding all federal elections, even though most of the specific allegations center around the presidential race. While the committee's current protocol does not specifically broaden the investigation, Neither does it limit the committee from taking investigative leads wherever they go, wherever they go, within the committee's jurisdiction. The minority's amendment would unduly narrow the scope of the investigation also because many of the actions we are currently investigating did not necessarily occur in the 1996 election cycle. They are part of a pattern of behavior that started much earlier in some cases in 1992 and 1993 and 1994. John Wong, who has taken the Fifth Amendment, first raised money in the 1992 campaign while an executive at the Limpo Bank in California. Many of the questionable actions that occurred in the Commerce Department, the State Department, the NSC, and the White House occurred in 1994 and 1995 with various donors. For example, Webb Hubble getting paid by the Lippo Group, the Riottis, a long-time large donor to the president occurred in 1994 while Hubble was under investigation and, of course, was later indicted. The White House overnights began in 1995 or earlier. The abuse of the NSC for political donor purposes started as early as 1994. Ron Brown's use of the Commerce Department for donors began in 1993. The committee is currently investigating well-publicized allegations of attempts to corrupt the American political process by individuals such as John Wong, Charlie Tree, and others. Some of those people have fled the country. Already we have amassed significant and troubling documents in connection with these questionable figures. Substantial evidence of improprieties or illegalities will be pursued wherever they lead. 
Mr. Chairman, yield to me. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman will you yield? Uh, I'll yield to the gentleman from uh, Virginia, Mr. Davis. Let me just ask. So there is nothing to preclude a wider scope of investigation, including some of the matters brought forward by the gentleman from California. That's absolutely correct. If the evidence should lead there. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Thank you. Gentleman, yield. Uh, Ms. Morello. I, I just wanted to call to the attention of the committee, again, in a bipartisan manner, that the original draft we had of the protocol, this is a significant change, because what it did is it uh, mentioned just executive branch officials and government agencies in the 1996 presidential campaign, so that the wording in the protocol that we have before us is the kind of scope that allows us to go beyond 1996, if there was something in 1994, and to go beyond the executive branch and beyond government agencies. So if it's congressional, so be it, it's congressional. And I, I just don't know how you, you, uh, uh, you know, craft it so it does the kind of thing we want it to do as we explore in, in other words. So I think the one that we have before us is, um, is going to serve. serve Gentle lady, yield to me. Yes. I, I, well, I have, actually, I have the, the chair. I just, want, I, I just want to say to the gentlelady, lady, I think you tried to get in the protocol what we all wanted, and I tried to avoid offering an amendment, but I couldn't get a straight answer to my questions. Now, uh, the question was raised whether the, that we're limiting in some way by having the word 1996 election, federal elections. I don't think this addition, which says which shall include an investigation of illegal or improper activities in connection with 1996 federal election campaigns limits us in any way. If anybody fears it might, I'd ask unanimous consent to strike 1996. And uh, then it would be without doubt that the amendment is consistent with the language in the protocol, and it would be consistent with the Senate language, which Senator Thompson has been willing to say would include looking at the White House, the DNC, the RNC, and Congress, Democrats and Republicans. I want that to be clear, and I think the amendment would be clear. May I ask unanimous consent to perfect my amendment, Mr. Chairman, to strike the word 1996? Without objection. Would the uh, chairman yield? Uh, be happy to yield to Mr. Barr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, in terms of uh, legislative draftsmanship, uh, the position is just uh, put forward uh, is problematic. If, uh, in the opinion of the gentleman from California, uh, the language does not expand the scope, uh, then it's superfluous. Otherwise, there's, there, there's, from a legislative standpoint, it's superfluous language if it doesn't expand the scope. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't uh, understand what the purpose of it would be then, and I think we'll, we'll be asking for numerous problems down the road if we include this, uh, this language, and it doesn't matter whether it says 1996 or, or 1492. Uh, it doesn't matter what the year is. The, pro the problem is, is uh, I think, uh, very clearly, as the general lady from Maryland has said, is a limiting amendment. And uh, for the life of me, I can't understand why, the, uh, why it's being proposed by uh, folks on the other side that say they want to broaden the scope of the, uh, uh, the committee's jurisdiction. Gentlemen, yield to me. Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, let me, let me, kind of, if I could just ask and oh, try yeah. to clear, maybe we can clear it up. I don't know. Uh, it seems to me, though, that in the protocol of the scope that is contained in the protocol and with the chairman's explanation, nothing you've asked for is precluded from being part of that should the evidence lead in that direction. In addition to that, it allows for state campaigns, and there have been allegations here of some money going into state parties like in Virginia, uh, bribery, those kind of issues would be included as well. So I think your scope is included in a very wide-ranging scope contained here, and I think we have the, the chairman has said uh, on the record, and other members have represented that as well. So I think you have what you need in this case in terms of having the scope as wide as it, as it needs to be if, if that's where the evidence uh, leads. Mr. Waxman. Well, but you Mr. Have to have chairman, uh, if you'll say that if there are possible violations of the law or improprieties in campaign finance that we may look at that include the Congress, I'll withdraw this amendment. I just want that very clear on the record. The amendment I've offered is one that passed 99 to nothing in the Senate, but I'm willing to withdraw it if we can have a clear statement that if down this road that we're following there are campaign abuses and perhaps illegalities in the Congress, that we're going to look at it. It's within the scope of our investigation. Uh, Mr. Waxman, I've stated I think four or five times, you know, the scope of the investigation uh, I have nothing further to add. Well, then can we go to a vote? 
Yes, sir, we sure can. Let's uh, have a roll call. If there's Chairman, no further Mr. Chairman, I, I may have be heard. Mr. Chairman, I'm just curious. I, I just, I'm sitting here as a new member and I listened to what was just said. And I think what Mr. Waxman requested is not un, unreasonable. And I, I'm just curious if, and I, I as a new member want to know, if it does lead down the road to congressional violations, will we look into them? I, I, I want to know. You are the chairman. And there's another problem with it, and that is when you look at all the discussion that we have had already, one of the problems is who, is, who decides what is substantial evidence or whatever it is, whatever the, 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 uh, the, uh, With the gentleman you have just, just, just one moment. So I just want to know if it leads down the road to congressional violations, will we look into that? That's all I want to know. That's all, I, that's all I want to know. And I don't think that's an unreasonable question for either side. Uh -huh. Whatever is within the jurisdiction of this committee will be looked into, period. Well, I... Gentlemen from... Mr. Chairman, would you gentlemen, 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 please allow... Let's just go to a vote. No, the Chairman, chairman doesn't want to answer the question. Mr. I'm not going to beg him. I, have, I, have I don't think we ought to beg him for this... I, Mr. For, Wackner, for, the, Mr. for this clarification, I, uh, uh, let's just vote. I yield a balance of my time to Mr. Fatah. I just want to ask for a quick unanimous consent to enter sure. into the record before we vote. Sure. This is a transcript from uh, This Week. Uh, it used to formally be called This Week with David Brinkley, but it's now just called This Week uh, from March 16, 1997, where the chairman of the United States Senate's Intelligence Committee says that he was briefed that the Chinese was looking into co-opting the Congress and state legislatures. And uh, I, know I just think that if you're saying to us that we're looking at foreign influence, and here's the chairman of the Intelligence Committee of the United States Senate saying that his information was that what they were looking at doing was influencing the Congress, that not concurring with our ranking member and with the gentleman, Mr. Cummings, that we're at least willing to look at the Congress we may miss the whole boat here, and I want to enter this uh, as on the unanimous consent, this transcript into Will the, the gentleman record. Yield? Thank you. Will, Will the, the gentleman, gentleman yield, Mr. Fatah? Will you yield over here, Mr. Fatah? This is your time. Uh, Mr. Cummings, yield. would you yield to Mr. Barrett back here? Yes. I yield to Mr. Barrett. I would ask unanimous consent to add the words, but not be limited to following the word include, so that we make certain that we are not in any way shrinking the scope of this investigation. So the amendment would read, which shall include but not be limited to an investigation of illegal or improper activities in connection with the federal election campaigns. Ask you, unanimous consent. You're asking unanimous consent to, ask to add that language? Yes, I am. Uh, do we have the wording? Okay, would, uh, would you read that again, please? I would be adding the words, but not be limited to, after include. So it would read, which shall include, but not be limited to an investigation of illegal or improper activities in connection with federal election campaigns. Without objection. Well, Further discussion? Oh. You back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Oh. If no one Mr. else... Mr. Mr. Chairman, speak. Mr. Chairman. Who seeks time? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chase. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I haven't yet spoken today, and I've served on this committee for 10 years, and it's, it's an absolute privilege to be on this committee. And I've been on the minority and the majority. And uh, one of the things that I know the minority has is uh, absolute right to speak uh, and to speak until their heart's content. Um, uh, we had a bipartisan hearing when we went after HUD. And I would suggest that one reason why it was bipartisan was the minority members made sure we went actively and pursued an investigation of the executive branch, which happened to be of their own party. And it was probably the most difficult thing I have ever done in my life. And I had hoped that when I was in the majority, I would see that same willingness on the part of a new minority to stop some of what we're seeing happening. Now, I want to speak on this particular issue because it's issue, this is a language which I argued with my, with my conference to have in our language. 
And it is very clear from what the, this, our chairman said that we have the right to look at wrongdoing wherever we find it. He couldn't have been more clear. But somehow he had to answer yes or no like he was on the witness stand. It is so clear that even an idiot would understand that we have jurisdiction over the executive, legislative, or judicial branch. This committee, the protocol says, the protocol shall apply only to committee and subcommittees investigation of political fundraising improprieties and possible violations of law by persons or entities within the committee's oversight jurisdiction. The committee's oversight jurisdiction is from Rule 10, Clause 4C2 of our rules. In addition to its duties under subparagraph 1, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight may at any time conduct investigations of any matter with it, with, without regard to the provisions of Clause 1, 2, or this clause, conferring jurisdiction over such matter upon another standing committee. And then it says the committee's findings and recommendations in any such investigation shall be made available to the other standing committee or committees having jurisdiction over the matter involved and included in the report of any such uh, other committee when required by Clause 2, 1, so on. This committee has 306 degrees jurisdiction. I would fight to my death if any other member of Congress sought to take away the power of this committee to investigate wherever we have to. The chairman's committee's statement says it perfectly and very clearly. And I just think that, uh, Mr. Waxman, that you're really straining out gnats and swallowing camels in this amendment. And I respectfully ask that you withdraw this amendment. I call for a vote on the amendment, Mr. Chairman. If no one else seeks to speak. Mr. Chairman, just a point of inquiry. Was my language included? Yes, it was. Thank you. If no one else uh, seeks to speak, the vote is on the amendment as amended. I ask for a roll call vote. From the gentleman from California. A roll call has been requested and will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes no. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Shays? No. Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes no. Ms. Ross Layton? No. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Horn votes no. Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Davis from Virginia? Mr. Davis from Virginia votes no. Mr. McIntosh? No. Mr. McIntosh votes no. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes no. Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sanford votes no. Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sununu votes no. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Sessions votes no. Mr. Pappas? No. Mr. Pappas votes no. Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Snowbarger votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Portman? No. Mr. Portman votes no. Mr. Waxman? Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Mr. Wise votes aye. Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Condent? Mr. Condent votes aye. Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes aye. Mr. Holden? Mr. Holden votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Blagojevich? Mr. Blagojevich votes aye. Mr. Davis from Illinois? Mr. Davis from Illinois votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Gilman? 
Yes. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Gilman votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. McHugh? Mr. Scarborough? Can we combine? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Owens? Well, let's combine the two and vote on Mr. Two. Towns? Ms. Norton? Mr. Tierney. The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 16 ayes and 20 nays. The amendment is not agreed to. We have uh, two technical amendments that's been cleared with the minority. Uh, with una Chairman. by unanimous consent, uh, Mr. We'll Chairman, consider those uh, approved. Mr. Chairman, who seeks recognition? Oh, Mr. Davis. I wanted before we get to that, if I could just, I was out in the morning to say I would have been recorded as voting no on the previous question and no on the first Waxman amendment. You will be that will okay. be uh, put, in put in the record. Put in the record. Mr. Chairman, I the, seek the, recognition the, the, for the, the purposes two. of offering an amendment. Beg your pardon. I seek recognition for purposes of offering an amendment. Uh, is this a t one of the technical amendments? Mr. Yes, it is. Uh, we, we asked unanimous consent that the both technical amendments be approved by unanimous consent, and it was agreed to with the minority. Okay. I thank the chairman. Okay. See how effective you are there, Mr. Cox? Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ms. Maloney? Um, unfortunately, I was not here for Waxman's amendment, and if I had been here, I would have voted yes well, give me the on, on, on minority subpoenas. Give me the Thank you. Without uh, objection, it will be put in the record. Uh, the question now comes on final passage of the, uh, of the document of protocol. Uh, the ch the ranking uh, Democrat has requested a roll call vote. It will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Aye. Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Shays? Aye. Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Roth Layton? Aye. Ms. Roth Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Horn? Aye. Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis from Virginia? Aye. Mr. Davis from Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Aye. Mr. McIntosh votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. La Tourette? Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Snowbarger? Aye. Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Portman? Aye. Mr. Portman votes aye. Mr. Waxman? No. Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos? No. Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Wise? Mr. Wise votes no. Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns, Mr. Kanjorski, Mr. Kanjorski votes no. Mr. Condit, Mr. Condit votes no. Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney, Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett, Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton, Mr. Fatah, Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Holden. Mr. Holden votes no. Mr. Cummings? No. Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? No. Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogoyevich? No. Mr. Bogoyevich votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? No. Mr. Davis from Illinois votes no. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Turner? No. Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? No. Mr. Allen votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Mr. LaTourette? 
Mr. Latourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Owens? Mr. Towns? Ms. Norton? Mr. Tierney? Mr. Chairman, there are 21 ayes and 16 nays. The protocol is adopted. Before we uh, adjourn, I wanted to welcome our newest member of the committee, Representative Rob Portman of Ohio. We really appreciate you being with us. Uh, not only do we welcome him, but I ask unanimous consent that he be assigned to serve on the Subcommittee on Government Management, Information, and Technology. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, the gentleman from California. I'd just like to say, Mr. Chairman, I uh, commend you for the patience you have had during this rather complicated hearing. <laughs> And uh, my colleague, Mr. Shays of Connecticut, as I've said before, uh, before I was ever elected to Congress, I admired what the Lantos Shays Committee did in investigating HUD. And I would just hope that all members of this committee would act as Mr. Shays did when it was his administration under fire. He went after him hammer and tongue. And I would hope there's a sense of outrage, regardless of who does some of these things that we can work in the public interest. And I think you've shown by your presiding today that's exactly what's going to happen. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the kind remarks. Staff will have three days to make all necessary technical and conforming changes to the protocol. We stand adjourned. The Senate Governmental Affairs Committee will also hold hearings looking into last year's presidential and congressional elections. Yesterday, the House passed a bill to prohibit paying for assisted suicide with government money. Today, the House is not in session. Members next meet Monday for a pro forma session. Tuesday, they'll take up a number of bills